Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, how's it going? Everyone, going good? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, um, Hamza's going to give you a little gist of what's going on this stream. So, Hamza, do you want to do you want to take it over? Oh, you're Hamza you're muted. Hamza, you're muted. All right, there we go. No worries. Okay. Uh, yeah, today's stream. Um, we did ask that Dr. John from last time to come on and do a summary with us. Because he seemed to have a little bit about him uh, compared to the other Christians we've had on. Anyhow, um, he's, I don't think he's available. He may come on, we don't know. So what we've decided to do, we're going to summarise anyway. So what we're going to do, we're going to underline everything we've done so far. So we're going to look at the historicity of the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Um, obviously, Christians build their theology upon this, so it needs to be historical for them to build theology on things that they say happened or Jesus said. So we're going to recap. We're going to go again back to start again with the Gospel of Mark and show the problems. Gospel of Matthew, show the problems. Gospel of Luke, show the problems. Gospel of John, show the problems. And then reiterate what happened when we came to the uh, Acts of the Apostles. I hope there's Christians. On, there seems to be Christians in the chat bouncing about there. Robin Boom, I see. He's, he's speaking largely, saying Muslims are inconsistent and all this stuff. So you're welcome to come on. Just don't mention the Quran. Just depend what we're talking about now. So that's basically it. So our number one recapper is Imran. So I'm going to pass it over to him now, inshallah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you for passing on to me. Um, so there's there's been a, a huge amount that's been covered over over this, uh, particularly on the Gospels and Acts that we've been going through. And summarizing actually all that information, all the gems that the brothers have put out there for you, is actually going to be something quite difficult to do. But we're going to try and fit it into the stream so that we can give in a summary, all of the key points to uh, arm the brothers and sisters in their discussions with our fellow Christians, um, particularly because when the Christians talk to Muslims, and this has been our issue from the beginning, they talk about how the, the Gospels are a historical account, and they talk about eyewitnesses, and they talk about that this is, has to be uh, believed because it's historical. And that's really the approach that we've taken. The approach from the beginning, Brother Ajad mentioned right in the beginning when we, when we started with, initially with the crucifixion and actually reiterated it intermittently throughout the time was that this is a, this is a, there's two ways of having a historical discussion. Um, the evidence can be either um, histogra histographical, that means writing, or it can be archaeological. There's no, there's no archaeological evidence for the things that you see in the Bible. So then we have to rely on the, the histor historiography, so the writings that we have. And so the examination has been of the writings from the beginning. Um, so just in, in a, I'm going to, so I'm going to make very broad points just to sort of summarize. So things that we know, the gospels, when they were originally written, um, we don't know the datings. The earlier manuscripts that we have, have been dated from second, third, fourth, fifth century, depending on which gospel you're talking to, talking about. None of them were signed. In fact, for for um, Mark, for example, this was inserted into Sinaiticus afterwards. Uh, the name was inserted afterwards. Um, so the names were attributed later on to these texts. And the justification for these is something that we looked at. So no, they weren't named initially. The names were added later. And there's issues with how the naming was put down in the first place. And then we looked at uh, each of the manuscripts and when they were from and what they contain. And then the, then the approach was to look specifically at what was within each gospel. So we showed two, a few things, internal inconsistencies. So we showed how, for, so let me just give one example. So for example, when we spoke about Mark, uh, Brother Ajaz mentioned that um, in Mark 2.26, there is mention of uh, Abiath being the high priest during the time of David. And actually we know from, um, uh, I think where was it quite as first Samuel's in 20, it was first Samuel 21, that actually was uh, Amalek who was the high priest. Now this is supposed to be Jesus who's quoting this as an evidence and he gets a historical issue wrong. Now that's one example that really stuck to my mind in Mark because why this, these are words that are attributed to Jesus, please be upon him. And he's making a historical error literally at the get go, so Mark two. And we demonstrated further things similar to this all the way along. And you know, I, I, what I'll do, when we spoke about Matthew, there were lots of things with Matthew. So. Mark, we know, wasn't a disciple, and Luke, we know, is not a disciple. So these two, th two people automatically do, do take away from themselves the title of being um, eyewitness because they, they simply weren't there. We have two contenders, really. We have Matthew and we have John. So when we look at Matthew, um, the, uh, 
lots of things that we see. What we see, seventy-five to ninety percent of Matthew is copied from Mark. So the first question that comes to mind is why would a potential disciple, so this is the theory that's given that he's a disciple, be copying from someone who isn't a disciple verbatim? And this already puts and it's and the vast majority of his uh, of his text is there now. There are lots of issues with this. So we talked about the naming and uh, the issue with Papias, who, uh, who who mentioned specifically that he, Matthew was written in the Hebrew, but we don't have a Hebrew Matthew. And um, we probably, we it's probably that he was referring to a different script that exists. Um, and so what we so what we see from this actually is that even the naming isn't very clear and the, the, the potential um, God disciple is writing from uh, and a copying from a non-disciple and then we compared the the we looked at the genealogy and there were errors within the genealogy went specifically through some some of the the problems that we see uh, internally within that now and then we had then we spoke about um, 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 Luke I think it was and I've you know I've been making notes all the way through this and every time we come to a gospel we see there are issues so either there's in internal historical issues or there's historic, or there's issues between the Gospels themselves, and this was just the synoptics. And then we came to John, and John was a whole other kettle of fish. So this is a completely different uh, narrative, different timelines, different chronologies, uh, different presentations of Jesus, different words being used, and lots of there's lots of examples that the brothers have given that we'll recap over this time, that clarify for us actually that uh, the people writing these texts down weren't weren't eyewitnesses and made classic made errors that would make you doubt their uh, their veracity and as a, as a as a christian speaking to a muslim all we would say is that actually um have the decency to say look this is the information that we have some of this may be historical and some of this may not be historical that's a reasonable position to take but if you come to us and say this is all historical and you have to take it verbatim because these were eyewitnesses, then the information we're going to present in a, in a while will show that. Then we went on Acts and Acts is a whole other section and we, there was lots of things that happened in Acts uh, that really um, would would would, would, would show uh, lots of things. So uh, what I'm going to do is, well, rather than try and summarize all that together because lots of things are going through my mind, I'm going to let the brothers maybe say the things that have stuck out for them as being the most powerful and memorable parts of the uh, of the of the contradictions or the internal errors that have come forward, and then we'll take it from there, inshallah. So I, I try to summarize a little bit, but I think there's a lot to summarize there, brothers. Very well done. That was much. So, so go for it. Uh, anyone want anyone want to say what they thought for them really stuck out? So, well, I, I have one something that stuck out for me um, was the idea that um, in the Gospel of John. Jesus makes a lot of profound statements. Uh, I am, and um, basically most of the statements to make Jesus divine come in the Gospel of John. But you don't find these statements in the uh, synoptics, in the previous Gospels. Now, we know this Gospel of John was the last one written. And we know that the, from what we've re already researched, we know the authors of these Gospels were writing hearsay. They were writing what the people were saying Jesus said and Jesus did and such. They weren't themselves eyewitnesses. So it seems bizarre that in the writings of Mark, Matthew and Luke, there's no mention of this God like Jesus making these because these are supposed to be historical claims he made in front of multitudes. So why were the people not talking about these profound statements and recorded by Mark, Matthew and Luke? For me, that's one of the biggest historical errors from what I can see that because once you've established that the authors of the previous synoptics were not eyewitnesses and relied on on um, hearsay of other people who were eyewitnesses, then it seems that nobody heard Jesus say those words until we get to the Gospel of John, and then we see. Then when we look at the when the Gospel of John was written, we can see what it looks like is that a version of Jesus is being inserted into history that cannot be found prior to that. Now, for me, that was the biggest standout. I don't know what you guys think, but for me, that was like, wow. Okay. You're on mute, bro. Did I mute Listen, that? You're on mute. You got... oh, oh, uh, no, I, no, I'm no, glad no. I wasn't on mute. That would have been oh. a headache to repeat. <laughs> 
Then Zam, can you do me a favour? Could you talk? Oh, a bit okay. Can you hear me muted? now? Uh, yeah. I was. Ju- I-, I was. Yeah, just- can't hear you. Oh, cool. I don't know why. Yeah. I was just oh, saying, yeah, um, there was now. this E.P. Sander quote, um, which was mentioned during the John stream about like how um, the Jesus of the first three Gospels and how the Jesus of the fourth Gospel, how both of them have radically like different ministries to the extent that they're supposed to, they're supposed to overlap and parallel with one another. But because they're so radically different, um, it seems unlikely that John... Uh, reported 50% of how Jesus ministered one way and the other synoptics reported or, or the, the first three supported the other 50. Uh, it, it seems very unlikely because um, at least in Mark's gospel, Jesus doesn't perform miracles in order to generate faith or belief in him. When he's challenged um, in Mark's gospel about to give a proof or a sign about uh, his identity, um, Jesus refuses any miracle in, in, or any sign in, in Mark chapter 8. Uh, but in John's gospel, he does the very opposite thing that he says he won't do in the in Mark's gospel. Um, in fact, he does signs in order to generate belief or faith in him. So I thought that was quite astonishing um, that you can have this kind of two radical, like different presentations of Jesus next to one another and both are supposed to be covering the same time on which Jesus ministered. And it's not only that um, the synoptic Gospels or the first three Gospels are missing many of the prof- um, the profound claims that Jesus makes in John's Gospel, but even John's Gospel is missing Jesus' uh, important teachings, such as um, teaching about the kingdom of God uh, it's near, um, as well as he's teaching about the coming of the, the Son of Man. Um, whoever rejects me, in, uh, whoever from this generation rejects me, so shall the Son of Man also reject them when he comes. Um, I, 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 and many other things, like uh, when Jesus speaks about like how, um, you know, um, he's not come to abolish or destroy the law, but he's come to fulfill it. But where Jesus speaks about the law in, in John's gospel, um, he speaks about the law as being your law, uh, as the Jewish law. So it, it's no longer about Jesus coming to fulfill the law, but it's now almost like the law is uh, is another scripture which belongs to the Jews, whereas Jesus has now come with new teachings which supersede or maybe even abrogate um, the law of the, of the Jews. Um, but one of the new things I learned um, when, st- um, you know, s- studying for these streams um, is um, that there's, uh, there's, there's a, a point which I've been mentioning for the past couple of weeks, um, like in conversations that I've been having. And that's to do with um, like the internal kind of, um, I guess, contradictions like in John's gospel where, uh, Jesus um, is reported to have performed the first miracle is turning water into wine. But then in chapter 4, verse 54, uh, I mentioned the second miracle that Jesus performed was healing um, of a man's son. Uh, but in between, we're told, like in uh, John chapter 2, verse 11, and also 22 and 23, um, that Jesus performed many miracles in Jerusalem, and as a result, many people believed in him. So uh, how can Jesus had performed the second sign if before that he had done many signs prior uh, and as a result many people came to believe in him? So I found that to be um, problematic and also I was aware of some of the issues before but it just came out more clear like when, um, it, you know, in Mark chapter 13 when Jesus speaks about um you know where he's going and so on um in answer to the question that the disciples ask him where are you going uh like in mark chapter 13 verse 35 but then in john chapter 16 verse 5 oddly enough he says nobody dares to ask me where are you going um but but um hence you do have like the two of the disciples peter and thomas or, or philip asking jesus where he was going um, so things like this uh, seems to confirm like what biblical scholars have been saying is that John's gospel has gone through like a process or serious stages of like um, editing. 
um, and people have tacked in or added uh, later editions or later stories about Jesus to some final edition of John's Gospel. So, uh, and to be honest, um, before we started these streams, um, many of the stuff I have forgotten and kind of like gone off. And doing these streams, I personally find it educa um, edifying for my own personal education. Um, and I found that even my, my own dawah has like improved uh, because, because of uh, by doing these streams as well. Alhamdulillah. That's awesome. Jess, you're up. Uh, so, alhamdulillah, I, I think I've personally benefited from these uh, streams a lot as well. One of the things which stood out to me is how easily um, our Christian colleagues have given up the appeal to historicity. Mm. Uh, I actually thought that the case for historicity was a bit better, but having done the streams and interacted with Christians on and off the streams, they just seem to have thrown in the towel and they've gone the route of the uh, the Mormon Church, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, it doesn't need to be historical, but the message overall is true. And that disappointed me because I felt as if for the last 30 years I've possibly existed. Not that I have existed for 30 years, I say possibly, is that uh, I've, I've been told time and again that there's historical evidence within the Gospels and it cannot be disputed. There's a strong historical basis for everything that's written in it. Maybe not everything, but most things. And it's a bit unfortunate because the responses that we got from some of uh, uh, the Christians that came on the stream was either one of two things. One, uh, we don't need historical information in the Gospels, or two, uh, yes, we need them, but it gets more right than it does what it gets wrong. So someone like the dancing pastor, when he comes on, he wants to read off a list of like 50 things which he thinks is correct, but he also wants to ignore the things which are wrong, right? You have to contend with both. It's not just one or the other. There's going to be many right things and many incorrect things. The whole purpose of these streams is to ask, well, why are they incorrect if not that the primary author behind them is ignorant of some details or they weren't inspired. So I think I expected more of a spirited fight, something like a Dunkirk type scenario, but uh, we we got uh, pretty much the opposite of that. And that, that would be my uh, brief perspective. Yeah, because I had an interaction um, yesterday on a live stream on uh, the SC. I saw channel. that. Right. You, you can see this. I'm going to put that on my channel at Hamza's Den. Um, just that snippet from where I came on. Now, it was amazing because if you watch that, you'll see how everything we've been talking about here was amalgamated and used and utilized. And we're speaking to a guy who's a minister and he was preaching from the New Testament. He was from the Gospel of John this and Matthew this and all of this stuff. And then I addressed the elephant in the room as to why you believe the New Testament is a reliable source of information. And then I delivered our findings from what we've been doing in these streams. And you know what he said? Mm. I've never even looked at it. He's never even looked at it. Never even considered questioning his belief. He just, what did he, his words were? I believe it with all my heart and all my mind. And all my, don't matter, mate. You need to test your beliefs. And if you watch that, you'll actually see how what we've been saying here is actually utilized and there's no response. You've seen there's no response anyway, but this was in a, a debate kind of scenario. And it was, it was speechless. And, and this is the sad thing because what Christians, I don't think they get, oh, like you said, Ijaz, oh, they don't really care about the history. You cannot quote Jesus saying something because you're quoting a historical event. If he wasn't an historical event, then you can't quote it as an historical event. And then if you can't quote it as that, you can't quote it as truth, as reality. And, and this is the irony. Your, the theology, what you Christians base everything on, collapses if you have no historical references. Because it has to be historical. Jesus had to be there to say these things. And then, and then you can build a theology out of the things Jesus said. But if Jesus didn't say those things, I mean, you know, we had the Dr. John Owen last week. And, you know, 
he admitted, listen to this, Christian, please. I mean, and come on and challenge it. It's not a problem. He admitted when I quoted the Gospel of John that, yeah, what is what John wrote may not be exactly what Jesus said, but it's a kind of gist. So you get the kind of spirit of the message that Jesus was presenting. And then I'm like, whoa. So you're saying to me that those words that apparently John wrote are not literal? They're not specific. They're paraphrases. They, he may not have said exactly those things. And yet when you speak to a Christian, they quote those quotes word for word, emphasizing the specific, specific nature of that particular quote. So you can't have it both ways. Either you concede that it's paraphrased. It may not be the actual words of Jesus. But if you do that, then you can't build a theology upon that. So I think this is something Christians have to take from. Don't just watch this and. Oh, yeah, wait till we come to the Quran. Wait till we come to the Quran. We'll forget that. We're questioning your scripture right now. And it's embarrassing that no Christian, I see him in the chat all the time. Where are you? You know, these are simple things. When there's not academia, right? Questioning the manuscript dates and all that, that could be academic. But the basic things that we've brought forward, where are you? Because you do not, I don't think you realize what the ramifications of these things, if we're saying they're true. I don't think you realize the ramifications because you're tying your eternal soul to these beliefs, which are based on sand. Anyway, that's what I took from it so far. And I think that's really a, a profound thing. And I'm just going to reiterate that, that um, we will be getting to the Quran, inshallah, and we'll be going through the historicity of everything that Muslims believe in, in terms of scripture. And the, really the, the point for the Christians is that you must, your, your house has to stand on its own. So it's very easy sometimes to deflect onto another topic because we're not covering this. And we will cover the Quran definitely, inshallah. The, the thing that's really important is that if you're going to establish your theology, you're going to tell Muslims that this is the way you achieve salvation, then you need to start from a sure footing that your scripture has information that is historically reliable. And so all we, all we would ask you to do is to come and give us your reasons or respond to the things that have been raised uh, over the streams about why the history why the historicity of the, the New Testament, particularly the Gospels and Acts, is not reliable. If, if you can't do that, then you really have to question yourself and say, why am I believing this? And is it like the pastor who just believed with faith from the beginning because he was told that? And then what else could you believe because of that reason? Because then everything is believable. And I think really you have to, you have, when it comes to your salvation, we have to have a higher standard of, of evidence um, so please come on, have a conversation with us, um, but at least in your conversations with Muslims, uh, please be aware that Muslims will now, from now on, inshallah, be raising the historicity of the very text that you're quoting them from as part of the conversation. So if, you, if even if you don't come on here, you have to prepare yourself for these conversations in the future. That's very, that's right. This is oh, another level now. There's no more trying to quote from John and interpret it because we're just going to ask you why do you believe what John says and that's what you're going to need to respond to and uh, don't and please whatever you do Christian please 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 a beggar don't go to Timothy 2 3 16 as if it supports you a beggar please, please. <laughs> we're going to come to that anyway and so and so I just want to point out that uh, earlier today we received an email from a sister sister Romano so I'm just going to mention her name briefly oh, yeah. because I am um, heartened when I see that our young people go out there and they look up at the resources that we reference, they read it and they make their own notes. I was very pleased to see how articulate this sister was and how detailed some of her reading had become. So, you know, brothers and sisters, you know, pray for the sister, may Allah facilitate her gaining of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this just tells you that Muslims, we are capable we can read these things and we can understand them as they need to be understood. No longer do we have to sit back and tell a, have a Christian say to us, but you don't know the meaning. No, we've done our own reading from your own sources. Your own sources call this a contradiction. Kind of like uh, when I was using the NET Bible notes and we would get the odd Christian here or there. Yeah, but scholars don't say that. Well, it's in the scholarly resource. Yeah, but that's those scholars, the liberal types, not the real scholars. And then we quote their conservative scholars. I mean, Daniel Wallace, 
was one of the editors behind the NET Bible. So, I mean, how conservative can you get more than that, right? So, alhamdulillah, they, uh, I'm really proud of our people doing what needs to be done. May Allah continue to guide them and give them the means of uh, doing their own research and study. Amin. Amin. I think I need to change my background, yeah, because people think... I'm Everyone gonna... thinks it's your <laughs> <laughs> And I'm about to, play, about to crack open the piano. No, basically, it's a new hey, laptop, Frank, how's it going? and I forgot to... I forgot to upload um, a nice okay. green screen, and it was like, ah, it's either a brick wall, or I didn't realize there was a piano in the background. <laughs> right. It looks very realistic. Yeah, I know, but I think I might change <laughs> the brick wall. <laughs> people think I play the piano. Oh. I, do, I do need to say this, but I think a couple of people in the comments were asking if you're related to Alexa Sanchez. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's see. Uh, I see that brother Frank is here already. Welcome, Frank. Hey, Frank. How's it going? Hi, Frank. Oh, sorry, I just got in mute. It's my fault. There you go. Sorry, Frank. And I really have to go into work today. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to be discussing Paul today. That's, that's oh, what you yeah. said last week, because I had a few a few points that um, Ijaz made later in the talk after I left. Oh. Did yeah, you... no, we decided to do a summary because we don't think a Christian... Uh, has done a good job, to be honest with you, over the, all the streams. And that Dr. John Owen seemed to be, um, seemed to have a little bit of uh, academia about him. So we, we thought, well, because he was trying to quote things that we'd already covered. So we told him, watch the previous streams and we'll do a summary with you. And you can respond to each stream we've done and what you thought was wrong or whatever. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. Um, and so we thought, well, we might as well recap anyway, so we can underline what we've done so far, because things are about to take another turn when we come to Paul anyway. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new level. So we thought we'd underline everything we've done so far and then move on to Paul. So, Frank, you're either behind us or you're in front of us. Can you just stay with us, please? Well, you said you were going to discuss Paul. So, anyway, I just asked you, Jeff, did you see the – I left a couple of comments and I sent you an email directly, so you can address that when you come to Paul. But All right. Just on Anything the point we've just you, said now you want to contest. Yeah, okay. So, like, for example, you said no archaeological evidence. Now, like, what? I know we're not going to dig good. up, we're not going to dig up the leftover loaves from when Jesus fed the 5,000 or something like that. Frank, sorry, you know, sorry, Frank, Frank, who said no archaeological evidence? I don't remember anyone using the word archaeological in today's stream. Uh, Dr. Imran earlier Dr. said Dr. that Dr. we had little to no archaeological evidence. Oh, okay. There are two approaches. One is archaeological and one is histographical. Yeah. And we're focused on the histographical one. Okay. But so just on the archaeological side, now we're not going to find evidence of the individual things Jesus did, but there's just there's general things like, like for example, um, and look, you know that at, in the 19th century there was a, a huge turning against Christian faith and there was a whole lot of stuff said where the Gospels were written hundreds of years later, all the rest of it, there was total disbelief. And like... Things like the existence of Pilate was called into question. What, what, sorry, sorry, Frank, why, why was there such a bit of upheaval in the 19th century? Um, I guess it was the following from the Enlightenment, and it started in Germany, but there was a whole turning against, um, I guess... Correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it was due to Tischendorf finding the Codex Sinaiticus and realising that everything they've been reading so far in the New Testament actually was inaccurate. Oh, no, actually, that was the other way around. Um, the fact that they started finding manuscripts that which were old was actually, I guess, was, was beginning to start to push back the other way. But it, it, um, I'm just trying to remember the guy's name. Fairly early in the century. Tischendorf. No, no, he was late. All right. Uh, yeah, but he found the Codex Sinaiticus. And because of that, the revision of the Bible needed to take place. And so obviously there's going to be upheaval. And obviously there's going to be question marks around what they've been reading. No, so but, but it started long before that. And it goes back to the whole Enlightenment project that everything supernatural about the Bible was being questioned. And But, but what I was leading to is things well, like the, the existence of people like Pontius Pilate. They, they would say, well, you know, we've got no, uh, no evidence that he ever existed. Um, you know, the whole thing's just made up. But since then they found coins yeah. with Pilate on it. So... There's there's circumstantial evidence just about the the overall setting. So you've got you've got that side of it. You've got that stuff. You know, there's places in. What Jerusalem. do you think that proves? How how does what you've just said now to me? Let's just say, for example, 
Pontius Pilate existed as a historical character. Okay. How does that support the idea that the New Testament Gospels are eyewitness testimony written by disciples of Jesus, inspired well, by the Holy Spirit? Okay, step at a time. So you're going from them that these are just fantasy stories that someone made up and they're, you know, they're nice and... No, not fantasy stories. We're asking the question. Yeah. The so authors now, of the, so now no, no, no. The, saying... the, claim, the claim is that, Frank, Frank, just respond to the claim rather than a straw man. Okay. The claim is this. We're questioning the, um, the idea that the authors of the New Testament Gospels were disciples of Jesus who were eyewitnesses to what they wrote. Now, do you still hold on to that position that they were eyewitness disciples of Jesus? Um, they well, the ones we we know for for start that Luke Luke says he's not. He said he's spoken to the people who. Oh, were, Luke wasn't an eyewitness. Okay, who no. was an eyewitness? And and Mark and again, this is tradition that he like he was a young guy, and that he was attached to Peter. So he's no, giving. That's not my question. No, no, my question is very simple. Yeah, I'm asking you. Forget okay. why you believe. No, no, Frank. Okay, Frank. so but listen, just listen, Frank, Frank. Forget why you believe such and such a thing. Let's first establish what you believe. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, so Mark. So are you just, just let's just clarify. Mark was it. a partial no, eyewitness. No, no. Let's just clarify. You believe he was an eyewitness, Mark? Not of everything, because he wasn't a disciple. What he was, was he, he an eyewitness to? Well, for example, we believe he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's the young man who went. They grabbed him his cloak and he ran away naked, something. So that that's Mark riding himself. Well, uh, well, sorry. So there was. So you're saying in the Garden of Gethsemane there was people other than disciples with Jesus? Mark puts himself there. Are you saying Mark was a disciple of Jesus? <laughs> well, see, when you say disciple, I mean, there were thousands. One of, of the twelve. One of the twelve. There were the twelve. No, he wasn't one of the twelve. Right, right. So the ones who went to the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus were the disciples of Jesus, the twelve disciples after the Last yeah. Supper. After the, yeah. Right. So now you're saying to me there was a guy who wasn't a disciple of Jesus was with them. Well, he writes himself into the story. He's, he's but, but there was no disciple called Mark. No, but he said, so he, he's saying he's a... So if he's wrote himself into the story, he's going yeah. against the whole narrative because from what we understand from the New Testament narrative, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. Yes. He's 12. Yeah. So how's Mark there? Well, for... I'm not, I, I don't have access to that detail, but he no, puts... No, how does it make any sense? Because if Mark wrote himself in there, then it made no sense to the whole history of everything. Because it was the 12 who went with Jesus. Mark wasn't at the Last Supper, was he? He's not mentioned as being there. Right. So when they left when they left and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark wasn't with them. So then how can you say he was in but the Garden? But he, he was... Let's, I'll say he was with them because he was there in the Garden. So somewhere on the line, they picked him up. Uh, how, how, how did Mark get into the garden? I thought Mark was part of the pu pu puzzle because he was a scribe of Peter. Now, all of a sudden, you say Mark is one of the, with the 12. But I don't see where this argument's going. Like, well, no, it, the argument's going is you created history that never happened. But it's just that he's recorded it. He said he was there. Yeah, so if, if Mark has, the author of Mark has recorded he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's not Gethsemane. one of the 12, how, what's he doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? I don't, I don't see the problem. Okay, the problem is he's not one of the 12. That's the problem. And only the 12 went with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. Where does it say that? If you read the, the Last Supper and when they we, left and they went across the, the Kidron like Valley. We know, and, that and, Judas, we know that Judas didn't go with the 12. Like he, he, was, he was one of the 12 and he was there eventually, but he came along with a pack of soldiers. Judas, no, Judas was there. Judas kissed him. He came later bringing the soldiers, uh, the temple guards, to arrest Jesus. No, Judas identified the Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So, so Judas didn't. Judas, so Judas didn't wasn't at the Last them. Supper. Judas was in the Last Supper. He was at the Last Supper. Did Jesus? Yeah, he did was Judas there. Go? And then he left from the Last Supper. Like Jesus says to him, "What you must do, go and do quickly." So he walks out. The disciples right. think he's going to do something about right. the man. Let's go back to Mark. So the Don't disciples they've got to go. There. Don't tell me who wasn't there. Tell me how Mark was there. I'm trying to understand it. Well, they're, they're in a room in the city. They go to a place that's, a, I don't know, a couple of kilometres outside the city. They're going to walk there. What's to say they didn't, he didn't pick oh, him so up? Right. So your assumption is this. Non-disciples joined the disciples of Jesus and went with him. Well, well at least one did. Right. So... 
But you know that many people have been proposed as being the naked disciple. I mean, people have said that, you know, it was John, uh, it was Lazarus, it was James the Just. People have given lots of different yeah. guesses. Why, why are you saying it's Mark? The so naked why one. would you, I, I, why I would you say Particularly it's if Mark tradition. is talking about this person in the third third person, if you're it's writing not, something, would you say the young the young man? You wouldn't say that that of, of yourself when you're writing it as an eyewitness, because then that would make him an eyewitness, even though he's not. Yeah, but I, the reasons for saying it's Mark are extra biblical. I admit that, but the thing is, he was very close to the action, and that's what I've been saying all along. These people, like like. Luke says he wasn't there, but he's spoken to the people who were there from the beginning. So all of them, they were there close to the action. And the thing is... You've so got go back to my original question, Frank, because you seem to have avoided it. All right. Well, so sorry, the what's the original question? State the question clearly. Oh, oh, okay. After these streams, do you still believe the authors of the Gospels were eyewitness disciples of Jesus? Three of them were. Which three? Matthew, Mark, and John. Right. Have you not been watching the streams? Yeah, well, no, I haven't, I haven't seen all of them. All right. Frank, please. Yeah, you know, I do have a job. I've got other things. So I've, I've watched a fair bit. Frank, I, 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 also think, have, I also have a business to run. I have no problem about that. But the point is that... I think, you, I think you're slipping a, a lot of what... And I, it's impossible to refute everything you've said. I, it's just so many don't things. Don't refute everything. No, no, here's a beautiful thing, Frank. You don't have to refute everything we've said. Just refute one thing we've said. Just one thing will do. Okay. I came prepared to re refute what Ijaz said about Paul last week. That's what I came prepared to do. What did, what did Ijaz say last week? Okay, so Ijaz made this case about Paul um, saying that we shouldn't associate with immoral people. The Christians aren't supposed to associate with immoral people. If we touch their water, it corrupts them, all the rest of it. Second exactly. Corinthians chapter 6. Yeah, and you, you said 6 verse 4. It's actually verse 14 I think you're getting at. Okay. But the thing is, Paul deals with all those issues in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'm, I'm sure just you one know second, that Frank, Just one second, Frank, because it's not fair, because you're, you're paraphrasing what Ijaz said. So, Ijaz, can you repeat what you said that Frank is responding to? Yeah, so basically Please. I read from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where Paul compares believers with unbelievers, that you're not meant to be unequally yoked. And this implies even the touching of the disbelievers. So rather than me trying to interpret what the text says, do you guys mind if I just read it? Like, yeah, sure. So that, that way everyone can be on the same yeah. page. Yeah? Okay, so do not, uh, do not team up with unbelievers. What partnership can righteousness have with wickedness? Can light associate with darkness? Can Christ agree with Belial, that is the devil, or a believer join with an unbeliever? Can there be a compact between the temple of God and idols? And the temple of the living God is what we are. God's own words are, I will live and move among them. I will be their God and they shall, and they shall be my people. It continues, and therefore come away and leave them. Separate yourself, says the Lord. Touch nothing unclean. Then I will accept you, says the Lord Almighty. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. And this goes into the next chapter, verse 1. That will be the last verse. Such are the promises that have been made to us, dear friends. Let us therefore cleanse ourselves from all that which can defile flesh or spirit. And in the fear of God, let us complete our consecration. Yeah, right. So, so that's what the Paul only said. thing that you're not meant to touch is what, Frank? So, uh, the very first verse there is do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. So, the, the idea is yoke like you had two bullocks pulling a plow or something like that, and there's a physical beam across between them where one goes, the other goes. So, you, Christians can't be in a partnership with unbelievers where they're going to force to go the same direction. But that's, to, I mean, it's normally used about things like marriage or a business partnership or something like that. That's what we normally interpret as being. But Paul's clearly said it's not about just touching unbelievers because back in, in 1 Corinthians, yeah, he actually talk, talks about that sort of stuff. Um, it, like you, you quoted a bit about um, not associating with immoral people, and that's in 1 Corinthians 5. 
And it, like he says in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 5 verse 9, I've written to you in my letter not to associate with, the sexually, with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. And at the end of it, it says, um, but I am now writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler with such yeah, a man. Frank, that that refers to Christians, like immoral Christians. Yeah, this yeah, he's saying don't, 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 yeah, right. don't, don't associate with immoral uh, believers. Uh, yeah, but any, this is to do with touch, right? Yeah. So I'm but just going to, let me just like. But then, um, but then one, when it comes to talking Frank, about unbelievers. Frank, one sec. So do you deny that verse 17 is not talking about touching unbelievers? Sorry, Therefore, um, which, yeah, so it literally says verse 17. I'm reading from a second translation. I got uh, two. So in which, my book. which I can pick and choose. So first or second Corinthians, which one are you in? Uh, second, uh, same one, second Corinthians chapter six, verse 17. Okay, and I'm just going to read from the additional. I think this is from the revised English Bible. I could be wrong. Um, it says, Therefore, come out from them <laughs> and be separate from them, says the Lord. Sounds like segregation to me. I could be wrong. And and touch nothing unclean, then I will welcome you. Who, what is it, the unclean thing that you're not meant to touch? Well, in verse 16, he's just talking about the temple of God and idols. As uh, if you're, that you're you a, are a God. temple, that you yeah. are a temple. That's what verse 16 says. So it's referring to people being the temple. So what did I get wrong that you think was correct? Okay. Right? Well, again, go, go back to 1 Corinthians. So... In verse, he keeps coming back to this thing about this this thing of food sacrificed to idols, and in chapter ten, verse twenty five, um, he says, Eat "Any anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience for the earth is the Lord's." And then in verse twenty seven, if some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. So he's saying he, he can – so I guess he's actually responding to a question, you know, am I allowed to go and eat with unbelievers? Well, yeah. And, and what if they offer you food, give you food that's sacrificed to idols? Well, if, it's, if they just put what, what they put before you, you can eat it. It's fine. Yeah. Sorry, Unless sorry, Frank, I'm going to interrupt, man. I, I think what we'll do, leave this for the poll stream, yeah, because there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of grounding we need to do in this first because we're speaking like Paul's an authority here and we have to deal with that as a, consistently. And um, you've took us straight off path of what we were doing. And there's other Christians waiting, to, I think, to talk about what we're talking about. But obviously, Frank, your place is there. And when we're talking about Paul, which will be, inshallah, ne next week, yeah, Paul? Inshallah. Yeah, yeah so. you're welcome to come and talk about these things. But we have to establish everything first before jumping yeah. right into the middle of this and that and the other. Because we're going to rip apart uh, Corinthians and everything all, anyway. All, all I so. would say to Frank is that my sincere and honest advice would be to read what the church reformers, because you're a reformed Christian, you're not uh, Roman Catholic or Orthodox, read what they have written about these passages, about touching no unclean thing. And God will raise it then with the quotes in hand. And I would have you read out those quotes and I'll just remain quiet. And then perhaps then we can come to an understanding. But I do advise people at home as well. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Do for yourself some reading on the Christian commentaries and see what they say about touching unclean things. And you'll get the answer you desire. But thank you for coming on. Frank, it was good to okay. hear from you. Always a Don't pleasure, forget, Frank. blue is the color football is the game. I like your shirt. Okay, yeah, see ya. Okay. All right. Uh, ben. Ben. Ben's ben has died. Ben has died. Oh. Ben. I was going to say, hold Daniel back uh, because Bradley and Robin haven't been on before. And, um, we, you know, Daniel could take his shahada after we finish with Bradley and Robin. <laughs> I think uh, Ben. All right, Daniel, is that all right? Yeah, thumbs up in the chat. Inshallah. Ben. Ben. Daniel, do you mind if we just deal with the other Christians first? Is that okay? Of course. Oh, unless you've got something pertinent to what we're actually talking about. Yeah, but, uh, but I can wait. All right. Cheers, buddy. All right. Let, let Bradley on then. That's what Bradley's got to say. Oh, 
Hello. What's Ben doing? <laughs> Hi, Bradley. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, so, so basically, what I wanted to talk about was um, it was in one of the episodes you had, um, and you were talking about the mustard seed. Oh yeah. Yeah. In Mark's gospel. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm going to try and talk as I'm just going to try and go through this uh, as quickly as possible because I do have quite a bit to say. Even though we're talking to two. I think you're Robin, can you just put in the background? Um, Bradley, can I just can I just kind of guide you towards the format of what we do? Um, could, could you tell us what we said, and then sure. tell us why we're wrong about what we said? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you uh, basically said factually that the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed because there's a black orchid uh, flower that grows in the same region, and therefore you kind of dismiss the historicity in that sense of the mustard seed as just being. It was. I felt like it was kind of ridiculed in a way. I know you may have not meant to ridicule basically, it. Basically, I, I think if that was the case, it would have just been that if you're trying to say the mustard seed is the smallest seed and there's a smaller seed than the mustard seed, then the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed. That's all. Not a big deal. Okay, so what I want to kind of go into here is, is something that I've had to like research for myself and I'm up at 4.45 in the morning, so I haven't really been able to come onto your streams, but I've been listening to them whilst I'm at work, which I wow. shouldn't be doing, but no one really minds that much. Um, but I haven't had the time to actually come to you and talk to you until now. And I really know that you're, I'm stressed for time. You guys have got other people to talk to as well. And I want to go through the semantics of the mustard seed. And uh, I think it may, it, you may want to retract your statement, even though it will be a catch-22 because factually it's a, a black orchid seed. It's the smallest, as you said. But I feel like I have light that I can shed on this if that's okay. So, so basically what you're saying is, one of us said that where the Gospel of Mark mentions the mustard seed as the smallest seed, saying this is factually incorrect because there is a smaller seed than the mustard seed. Yeah? And what point did we make from it? Okay. The, I felt like the, the point that was made from this is that there's a lot of um of, it, it it links it links into how you're saying that either stuff is paraphrased or it's not verbatim it links oh, okay. into all oh, of that okay can so i just establish your position bradley if you don't mind sure. do you believe the authors of the gospels is paraphrased or do you believe it's actual eyewitness testimony i believe it's uh a a, a close resemblance and uh, a mix of the the a mix of both of them, and I've uh, looked at the um, what's it, Alexander the Great in the Opus Mutiny. They have um, I can't remember the name of the Greek scholar that wrote it down, but he wrote down this speech, which was all spoken, and they have all these points: point A, B, C, D, E. They all know oh, okay. all these points linked together, and it, it does it does um, uh, correlate to something that may have been right. spoken by. Here's, here's a problem you've got with that, Bradley. That position, your analogy, should I say? Mm -hmm. The whatever this particular thing about mutiny, there's no theology built up on top of it, is there? See, the problem you have, you see, is if you're par if you're saying what Jesus said is paraphrased, that means Jesus didn't mind actually have said those things. And if, if Jesus my actually... if my theology, sorry to interrupt you, Hansa, but if my theology is solely based on the pool of Siloam and Jesus healing the blind man, so the whole world can learn. No, but the, this is the problem you see. With the, you, you, you can't say Jesus did this, Jesus said that, unless you've de determined who said Jesus said this and Jesus did that. Okay, so, okay. So this is I'm, the whole point. This is the point we're making here. I'm on board, so, I'm on board with the point, but if I can't speak about what I want to say about the mustard seed... No, then... no, no, you can speak about the mustard seed, but I'm just trying to explain something to you. Okay. The fact that... I, see, me personally, I mean, I don't remember us making a massive point about the mustard seed. It no, would have just been one way, of the, the points way. maybe made up. I mean, there's bigger problems for the Gospel of Mark than this idea about the mustard seed. But I'm trying to understand what you think you... Okay, good to go for it, man. I, I, I don't even... Cause I just want to know your position. Now, you've just accepted okay. that it was paraphrased. Yeah, is that right? I've accepted that. I've, all I've tried to do is compare it to the speech of Alexander the Great. Which is and not paraphrased, can, yeah? And, and, and yeah, uh, yeah, wait, which, 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 which? If I were, for instance, a war general and I wanted to understand how to, the theology, put it yeah, that way, yeah, yeah. go back to the analogy of how to run my army, keep them happy and get them to respect me 
et cetera, et cetera, then I could look at that to do that. Okay. okay. I could look All right. But speak. the point here is this. Let's establish the point. We're talking about the New Testament here and we're talking about the Gospels. So are you saying that the, the Gospels are paraphrases of what Jesus may have said? I wouldn't want to nail it down like that. I would like to say... All right, that, let me rephrase it then. Do you believe it's accurately recorded what Jesus said? In my opinion, it would have to be down to me individually that it is accurately recorded. I can't give you the recorded. percentage. Okay, so you I believe... All right. I would so say... My next question, why do you believe it's accurately recorded? Okay, so say tomorrow I go out and I ride my bike to work. And I'm riding my bike to work and I hear a fly. And it, I, this is actually quite... I actually was stung on my uh, right temple the other day by a wasp. But anyway, say I'm riding to work and I hear uh, a fly and I dodge my head because I hear this fly. Now, I don't know if that's a fly, if it's a bumblebee, if it's a wasp or whatever it is. Say I now have another driver and this driver, whilst I'm riding on my bicycle, comes too close to me. And I don't take down his number plate quickly. I don't memorize it quickly. I can give you the best possible. I could be as certain as I can be about my own personal day and the things that happen to me but I will miss some of the final details. So to answer the question, if I'm answering the question, I would say, like I just repeated myself, it is accurate to the extent of which I can gather. And I wouldn't say, and I, to give you that, I wouldn't say it's verbatim, but at the same time, All right, I can travel enough. back in time. So, to so see if, if it's verbatim. not verbatim, then it may not be the actual words Jesus spoke then, is it? Again, if I could go travel back in time, if we can't say what was actually happening on the day we crossed the road and we look left and right and we can't say what kind Bradley, of car, Bradley, 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 leave the analogies alone, man. They're not, they're not marrying up. Let me say okay. again to you. You can't, you're saying to me that it, if the words that are in the New Testament Gospels are not verbatim, then they're not the exact words Jesus spoke by default. They'd have, you, to, be def they'd have to be verbatim to be the words Jesus spoke. So I agree with that. They'd have to be verbatim, but I right. would say that they closely resemble what was said from A, B, C. Oh, we can get you from can our closely point. resemble as much as you like, and we don't know how closely they did resemble. Okay. Agreed. This is the whole point. And then if that's the case, then you shouldn't then pin a theology to these specific words if they may not have been the specific words Jesus spoke. However, when we talk about the port of Siloam, all we know there is point. That, all we know... Point. I'm staying on point. The port of Siloam is, you, you have archaeological evidence there, which I'm sure you guys know as well. No, so no, this no. Is why just stay on point with the guys in the New Testament, please. There. Just stay on okay. point with the point. This gets to the mustard seed then, can we? Yeah, we yeah? yeah, I want to hear about the mustard seed and what you think it proves. No problem at all. But I just want to, you to accept what I've just said to you, that if you don't believe the words in the Gospels are verbatim what Jesus spoke, then you shouldn't pin a theology to these words as if they were specifically spoken. That's I all I'm have, saying. Anyway, can, come to the I mustard can, seed. Tell us about the mustard seed, man. Thank you. I know you've been studying all week for this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can see where you guys stand on that, Hamza, and I know you guys stand up, but you know I have my own opinion, and you guys have your opinion, and none of us are trying to sell anything here. We're just trying to get to the truth, yeah? No, but your opinion needs to be informed, and I've pre we've presented enough evidence against your opinion. But anyway, tell us about the mustard seed. You know, if I had all day, then I would get through every piece of evidence that there is, but I, I don't have all that time. Okay. Yeah, neither do we. Point out, neither do we. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm working. I'm riding and working everywhere, guys. Can I? This is going to take me about I don't know ten minutes, eight minutes. I want to get through it as quickly as possible for you. Okay. Come on then. All right. So the uh, so first of all, I'm going to go with the. This is all to do with gementria and to do with the alpha numerical value of words. Okay. So I'm going to go to. Uh, mustard, mustard, and how mustard is written in Hebrew. And now we have Chet, uh, Resh, Dalet, and Lamed, which is Hardal, which is mustard. I'm not putting the seed in there. This has a numerical value of 242, which is equal to the numerical value of Ariel, which is Ari, which is a lion, Al, lion of God. And then we have Zakor, which is, remember, Zakoriah, Zakoriah, which is the Lord, the name means the Lord remembers. So that's where 242 alphanumeric value of mustard leads us. It's also interesting to note that mustard is kind of the same color that you could describe a lion to have. Could I say something very quickly, Benjamin, before you carry on? Oh, please, it's Bradley, but please say something. <laughs> <laughs> my, my apologies, sir. I, uh, the, the text is small on my screen. Um, Bradley, you know, it's, it's interesting because 
you've, you've just admitted just a few moments ago with Hamza that the words may not be verbatim what Jesus said. And that means that the words can vary, but potentially the message may be um, accurate. Yeah, So the words can vary, but the message may be accurate. But then your approach to try to evidence uh, whatever point you're about to evidence is to take specific words and look at numerical value of the letters themselves to try and prove. I don't know what, where you're going with this, but it just seems contradictory because if the word could have changed, then all of your calculations and your, you know, oh, your opinion oh. that you're bringing could also have changed. So oh, the only way you can the only way you can establish what wherever you're headed, I'll let you carry on. I just just the, the thought came to me wherever yeah, you're please, headed, please speak it, yeah. you have to assume you have to assume your position has to be that everything is Verbatim. literally letter for letter exactly what Jesus said, not even words, the letter for letter what Jesus said, because you're doing numerology with the words. Okay, so that's, okay. That's, I feel that's a contradiction, but I'll, I'll let you carry on. Now. But we're, we're, I'm just focusing on mustard here, and then I'm going with these words, which are how they relate. Sure. Biblically. Yeah, but, but what, what the doctor just said to you, you've just accepted that these words may not be verbatim. I've accepted that you guys have accepted that, but I've said for me. What? What? what, 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 what? Sorry, no, no, no. I would no, no, say no. I'm, I'm not trying it. to tap dance, as you say. Yeah. Well, would you accept it? I try to this not get away from the point, and I don't want to say. Let's just say, uh, I grant you that. Yeah. No, but if we grant you that, there's no point telling us what these words mean numerically if they weren't the words Jesus used. I believe. Okay, I believe Jesus used the word mustard. No, but you 100%. don't because you don't believe it's verbatim. But when it comes to the mustard seed, for me. It is verbatim. So why? why, why, when it comes to mustard seed, is it verbatim? Once I get through this, maybe it, it will come to light and it will make some more sense to you. It, it's <laughs> I not going to take. Much it's not gonna, honestly, yeah, guys, I don't want to. I don't want to take up all this space. Yeah. Well, well go on, right? go on, go on. Let, let it go. Right. Sorry, if, it get, if it gets silly, though, bro, I'm going to have to cut you. Sorry, but go uh, on, sure, carry on. Sure, I understand. All right. So then we have. Um, so where were we? We are at 242. Ariel, Zachariah. Uh, that equals 242. We then have a fudge factor, left or up or down. And with the fudge factor, uh, we get to 241. And 241 is the 10 sayings of God in the uh, creation of uh, uh, Genesis. So we've got Omer. So that's Aleph, Mem, Resh. And if you put the uh, the vav on top of that, it's and said. So Veyomer. And then we have Emir, which is uh, word or a command. So this shows that mustard, despite the other things of the, the lion and Zechariah, is linked to the spoken speech which God used to create uh, the universe. Um, then we can also note that there, I can't give you the exact quote in the exact context, but there was a, a Jewish sage who also said that the, uh, the creation uh, came from a grain of a uh, uh, something similar to a grain of mustard seed. Now, when I go to work tomorrow, I'm going to get this another point to bring into this. I'm going to be getting paid peanuts. You guys know that I'm not getting paid perishable goods and peanuts, but you know I'm not going to be paid as much as I'd like to be paid. So I believe that it's a figure of speech here, and I believe it has a theological um, context. And even though you have that black orchid, which is smaller than the mustard seed, it shows that potentially hundreds of years later when we have these other Jewish sages talking about the grain of mustard seed being the whole universe and these parables that we have Jesus saying about the kingdom of God, etc. It, it, for me, this all sort of like molds together. And then we have in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 31, where it says that the uh, mustard seed is, is sown in a field. Now, is that verbatim, is that verbatim as well? We, we can get to that verbatim in just a second. Here we go. This is the bit what you might like then. So in Luke chapter 17, verse 6, he talks about the mulberry tree, doesn't he? And he says, you can pick up the mulberry tree and you can uh, put it in the, uh, uh, the sea. You can just say it and it will do. It will obey what you say. Now, before I lose myself of where I'm going, keep that mulberry tree in mind. Uh, we have, for the mulberry, mulberry itself is Tav Vav Tav, which is Tut, which is 806. And this is, oh. the same, this is the same numerical value of Zion, which is also 806. Now, 
if we take our original sum that we've done, and I appreciate this might be quite hard to follow, which came to 242 for uh, the mustard seed, mustard. Uh, if we just use four and two in that 242, we have four, five, six, which is, we keep the ratio in there, 206. We have dava, which is word. And if we go to two, we have our fudge factor with 241, if you can remember, was the 10 saints, the Omer. Then we have uh, 205, which is mountain. Now, this is where I want to finish this off now, back to the mulberry. The mulberry, as you may remember, if I just said, 806, same numerical value of Zion, 806. If we add 806 plus Har, which is a mountain, 205 together, we have 1011, 1011, 1011 equals the abyss, which is the seas, Yamin. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you were to go with just the original historicity and say, right, they should have spoken about black orchids, you wouldn't have all this theology included in one word. Bradley, can I ask you a question, mate? Sure. Do you believe the Gospels are eyewitness testimony written by disciples of Jesus, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I, I would say, though, let me just say, let me just say, I, I was All right, partially listening to what you said to What you need to do, Bradley, Frank. you need to watch these streams, mate, because uh, you've, not, you've not been paying attention. I have listened to what I was just saying now, please, just this one thing. I can't listen to any more. Mark, obviously, was the, uh, uh, wrote for Peter, okay? You know, he was an eyewitness, he wasn't there. He wasn't you, an eyewitness. He wasn't because he wasn't there. He was eyewitness to Peter. You could say that if we can get really so strong. You, so he was, okay, let, no, no, but let, let's start from the beginning. He wasn't an eyewitness, yeah? Was Matthew an eyewitness? I would say Matthew was eyewitness. Right, and have you not seen why we've, what we've responded to with regards to Matthew being an eyewitness and why we don't believe he was an eyewitness? I've seen these things, but I wanted to come at you with this no, one. No, 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 you want to come with the mustard seed, I get that. But So what is it um, about the author of Matthew, Matthew, author of Matthew, why we kind of, I'm wrong, please, that we uh, challenge the authorship of Matthew being a disciple of Jesus. What is it we said that you uh, contend? Well, with that, I would have to go back to it. I do would that. have to listen to it again. Do that, Bradley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's something well, I would so have to do. Here's the problem you've but, but, got, Bradley. I'll let me explain just say the problem you've got. You, okay, I'll listen to the problem in just a second. But can you promise me that if I do go back to that, that I will be able to come in and talk about most these definitely, because, Bradley. Most definitely, because you no you, you might be have a different narrative at, when I come to no, talk. No, no, then, you know? the, the, As long as you don't mention mustard, no problem. <laughs> Can I just make uh, a very uh, quick point to yeah. you, Bradley, before you go? Um, sure, I man. There's a difference between um, using a word and mentioning a word. So, if you use a word, you would say the mustard seed is, as the Bible says in Mark, the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds. So, I'm mm -hmm. using the word. Mentioning a word is you would you would mention the word you know mustard and then say something specifically about um, the the qualities of the word. So what you've done is you've taken the numerology approach, which assumes verbatim recording from Jesus, and you've said this is the intent. This is the intention of the author to to give us information about something you know, esoterical, and you've you've gone in that direction. But the, it still doesn't answer the question that the mention of the the the, the Textually, the text is is inaccurate. Now there are, and I'm, I know that I'm going off topic now, so I'm going to read. So w the Quran does do things where it mentions a word, and you can analyze a word in both ways: the mention of the word and the use of the word, and they will both be correct. That's called okay. abjad. Is that called abjad? Is that one that one's called? I, I don't know what abjad is. So um, okay. now for, I'll give you an example. So, for example, the Quran says that. If this was a book from other than God, you would find many contradictions within it. That word is only used once. So if you mm. look at the, the the meaning of the word or the use or mention of the word or the use of the word, they are both accurate. So the author was aware of both ways of ana analyzing this word. So it's I'm I'm quite heartened by your approach because what I see is you've essentially abandoned a historical approach and you've gone with numerology, which which for me shows actually there's no historical way of establishing the veracity of the words themselves. But even in the numerology, I was listening, and you used the word fudge factor. Mm -hmm. Now, fudge factor means the numbers aren't fitting. So you've had to adjust the numbers, fudge them, 
to get to the point that you're trying to make. So even in that direction, so it doesn't fit in the, in the, in the use of the word because the mustard seed isn't the smallest wheat seed. And even in the mention of the word, you have to have a fudge factor because it doesn't lead to the conclusion, even though you made a conclusion, uh, it doesn't lead to the conclusion without adjusting the numbers arbitrarily. Um, so thank you for coming. Yeah, care, Brad, Brad, can I just say um, thank you very yeah. much? Can I just say one more thing? So I missed it out. I forgot it. I just forgot it. That's all. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Up, it. Thanks for having me here as well. The last thing I wanted to say was cheers. It's synapti oh. is uh, in Greek, which is uh, three, four, two. And again, as uh, Imran just said, um, there is that uh, um, fudge factor. If I were a mathematician, I'd be able to give you the exact. Um, probability of these numbers linking up, but that's not something that I can do. But then when we have um, Elohim, I'm saying Elohim just because of the uh, uh, the respect for the word, what you have there is 343. So even the Greek of mustard links up with the words in creation which are, which are spoken. And I, I just want to say, thanks for letting me say that. Thanks for letting me try and communicate how I feel and get some of my points across. And I would, and I am going to go back and listen to everything now because you put it into your, uh, um, you can stream everything one by one. So I will be listening to things. I'll be making down my notes on my Evernote and I'll be happy to come here. But I'm not a scholar. All I have is what I can figure out for myself, okay? Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's all we ask for. Sure. All we ask for, Bradley, just find one finished, point. Guys. Just find one point and come and refute that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I all right. can hear you, Bradley, yeah. Bradley, uh, take care, mate. Yeah, I mean, just to uh, the other thing about the verbatim words of Jesus, uh, the manuscripts as well would have variations. So they would have like different words and different, you know, verses. So like no two manuscripts are identical. So I would imagine um, his numerology would also be affected by the variations in the manuscripts. Good point. Good point. Well, um, I, Robin I, looks ready I, for I a did. fight, man. Come on, man. Yeah, I yeah. Did, just, before, just, just before we um, get uh, someone else on, I just want to address the audience again. Um, so at the moment, we're inviting Christians to come on to talk about what we've been talking about along this stream and this summary. Um, but later on, we'll invite Muslims to come on if there's no other Christians willing to come on. OK, so please only come on if you're a Christian and you want to talk talk about this um, subject and then when we do invite the Muslims on um, please uh, just talk about this subject as well um, because the more you guys come on the, la the, the Christians that are trying to get on can't get on because it fills up um, so coming on to um, suggest what other videos we should do and stuff like that it's a little bit selfish so don't do that please but so only come on when we invite you guys okay Sorry, I just wanted to address that. And I think Daniel was next, wasn't he? Sure. No, I just want to hear Jazid's point. He was going to say something. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you for reminding me. In, in this case, I did look at the manuscript variants. Remarkably, there's like only one or two words in this entire uh, verse that would stand out that may like break some of the numbers that he was using. But generally, uh, it seems to be uh, after around the fourth century, they all seem to generally agree. The okay. earliest manuscript with this particular rendition is uh, Codex Nighticus, Vaticanus, and Ephraimi Rescriptus, but Ephraimi Rescriptus is partially present here. Um, there is a difference of wording with Codex Alexandrinus, I want to point out as well. Um, but I, I don't get the point. Uh, like, I know, I, I wish she was actually still here. I, what I wanted to yeah. ask was, why? jump through all of those hoops in the first yeah. place, right? I mean, okay, if it was for like a major theological point, I mm. get like doing all the numerology stuff, like I get that, if that's the way you cope with it, but I don't think as a basis to approach the other issues that you start off with one that you think it could be metaphorical or it could be hyperbole. They, he could have appealed to language devices to explain it. So, I mean, that seems like the easier route <laughs> as opposed to the other route where I think you lost most of the um, Or audience. could it just be that Mark simply made a mistake here? Potentially, yeah. yeah. I just want to say that I'm the one that took Bradley off just to make it run smoother. So, mm. sorry, Bradley. You had a chance to just come back a little bit there, but I took you off. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Okay, no worries. Okay, okay. bring Robin on next. Yeah, he's a, a new guest. Okay. Hey Robin, how are you doing? 
Just about. A bit better. It's like you're whispering. It's like you're whispering almost. I, I wonder if the audio is going through your phone and not through the uh, headset that you have. Can you like make sure like it's plugged in? Like, do you hear us, by the way? Do you yeah, hear I us? Hear. Uh, I guess we maybe can. you need to move the microphone closer. Should he just be like in the headphones? Uh, we, you're now muted, mate. You just need to unmute yourself. Click the unmute button. I believe. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, that's better. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's not that cool. Yeah, okay, look, you know, my sort of uh, um, where I come from is I'm probably what you call a sort of liberal theological Christian. I don't see the Bible as being the infallible word of God, but I do accept that the Bible contains God's word in part and, uh, and, and things that are, that are um, uh, valid. Now, as far as the gospel accounts are, um, are concerned, I sort of think that they have, uh, first century writings. I don't kind of sort of buy into the second century writings, and I think there's some good um, um, evidence for that. Um, the first one, um, the first one relates to Luke's gospel. Now, Luke obviously um, built upon what Mark wrote, and I kind of sort of go along with probably the what most scholars sort of say is that Mark's was probably the first one, first one that was written. Um, and then uh, Luke sort of built his gospel on, on top of what Mark said. Now, if we look at Luke, his writing, his writing style in Greek is very precise and very accurate. He's obviously a very learned man, an academic man. Um, I think it was Dante that, that said that uh, Luke's gospel was the most uh, beautiful uh, book ever written. Now, he was writing to a certain Theophilus, a person so how he so when he writes his gospel he goes into a lot of detail he obviously went and spoke to eyewitnesses um, he was a companion of Paul we know sort of Paul was beheaded by Nero around sort of AD 64 AD 65 um, and uh, in Paul's own epistles were probably written around sort of 50s uh, in into the 60s AD so they were kind of written within about 30 years of when Jesus um lived and died um so what to me is very critical as far as the dating of luke's gospel is concerned is that it is that at the end of the book of acts luke um we, we actually read that paul is still alive he is a prisoner in rome now elsewhere in acts um luke was quite happy to write about stephen's martyrdom he wrote about how james had been killed um so kind of writing about what people said, their famous last words and all that sort of thing is something that Luke records in quite um, extensive detail. Also, the last few chapters of the book of Acts, he, um, Luke was the companion with Paul and he goes into tedious detail of their journeyings, the people that they met, the different ones and all that sort of thing. So, so you know, he uh, um, because Paul is still alive at the end of the book of Acts, therefore his gospel must have been written prior to when Paul was beheaded. Okay. Can I have a question? I have a question right from the beginning, if you don't mind, Robin. Yeah. You said you accept that the uh, the New Testament and the Bible is not the word of God fully, but some of it is, yeah? Okay, let me sort of explain it. Okay, the Bible was written as, as a compilation of uh, about 40 authors over 1,500 years. So people wrote through the lens that they sort of saw the Let, world. Let's just the stick to the New Testament, if you don't mind. Okay, the, 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 way, the way they view the world. Because okay, we're doing the Gospels. Gospel, sorry? Because we're doing the Gospels, let's just stick okay, to the Gospels. Okay, Do you okay. believe, that, just so I understand your position, you see, because you started off saying you, you a liberal kind of Christian, you don't accept that the, all of the Bible is the Word of God. Are you assuming, is all of the New Testament the Word of God or not? Um. The New Testament again is written through the lens of the people that sort of saw it, how they and 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 how they understood it. So I think that Luke was very um, no, forget specific. But, I'm just but, trying to understand but, the basics. But, but it's a biography. These, no, no, no. These, so, but you, these you made are a statement. Biographies. No, but what it is, Robin, you made a statement earlier that I'm trying to understand because okay. you said you you believe some of it it contains the word of God, but not all of it. Is that is is that what you believe about the New Testament? Okay, look. 
as far as the word of God is concerned, that's a that's you've got to understand the whole concept of what sort of logos is or Legia is or Rima and all that sort of stuff. So I don't kind of want to get into a, a whole. No, no, lot no. I'm just going off your words when you first started. Your opening, your uh, opening statement was this. So I'm okay. trying to understand it. Okay. So okay. So the Bible is, as I say, is a compilation of a whole lot of historical writings. Historical some poetry, a whole lot of different things that are that are in there. But when we, if, if we're going to look at the New Testament, okay, so what Paul was writing, for instance, he wrote to various churches, to various people. He was addressing certain situations that right. he saw in. in, in okay, fact, no, no, I'm asking you, did do you believe any in of certain them? churches? As, as far as the gospel writings, they they are retrospective biographies. Right. So, so do you believe any of the New Testament is they the word are, of God? They, they, the, the, the gospel accounts are retrospectively written. Robin, I'm asking a very specific question just to understand your position. Are you saying yeah. any of the New Testament is the word of God or not? What I'm saying is that the word of God is that the Bible is not the word of God, that the None Bible contains the word, contains the word or words of God. Right. Do you believe the New Testament contains the words or words of God? Yes, it, yes, yes, it does. Right. Yeah. And how do you determine what is the word of God and what isn't? Ah, if you if you read what Paul says, he said the word of God needs to be rightly divided. So how do you rightly divide something? You need inspiration from the Lord Himself to actually. So how do you, you determine you what? So how do you determine it then? How do you know what's the word of God and what isn't? I don't, but the Holy Spirit does. Okay, so what? Okay, I don't. I don't you, know. You don't. I know. don't know, but the Holy Spirit does. And is the Holy Spirit within you? Absolutely. So you Spirit know now. There's a Holy Spirit. Can the Holy Spirit tell you? Pardon? Can the Holy Spirit tell you what okay. is the Word of God? So the Holy Spirit can speak to me through the words of the Bible. The Holy Spirit can speak to me through the words of. All right. Let's forget the theology. Right. Let's deal with the historicity. All right. Okay. So, okay. So anyhow, so going back to the historicity. Okay. So what they are is that the Gospel account, uh, they are retrospective biographies of yeah, people. Yeah. No. No. Robin, but here's the thing you see. People. Robin. Robin. Sorry to interrupt you again. I'll let you speak initially. Okay. Okay. We've done uh, maybe three months of going through the New Testament, through all of the Gospels. Each Gospel, I think, had uh, three streams, about two hours each long. And um, we, we challenged the historicity, historical claims. Sure, sure. And now you've, <laughs> you've come on believing they're historical straight away. No. No, what I'm saying is that is that they are retrospective biographies. So as retrospective biographies of eyewitnesses, okay, what they say, um, you were you you were challenging Bradley before about kind of you know, are they verbatim words of Jesus? Yes. You know, we sort of can't say that yes they are or no they're not. We sort of How can't would you say this that. question then? Because one of the things that I've noticed throughout all of this thing, because you basically saying they're retrospective biographies, yes? Yes, they are. Yes. Right, of Jesus, of Nazareth, yeah? Yeah. So when yep, we read yep. in the Gospel of John, okay. we see a lot of profound statements ah. uh, that Jesus claims divinity, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but we don't find any of that in any other um, Gospels. We don't find these sure. same statements. Sure. For example, sure. Jesus isn't referred to as the bread of life like he does in the Gospel of John, yeah? Sure, sure. So if this is retrospective biography, and this is a hearsay uh, non-eyewitness testimony, Second-hand information, if you like. Okay. Ah, no, but but but, but there you're wrong because in John was an eyewitness. John was an eyewitness. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you John, John was, was an, an eyewitness. eyewitness. Yeah. Yeah, and also possibly even Mark to a certain extent was. The reason why I say that is because you've got one little verse at the um, later on in Mark's gospel, which speaks about a young man who was at the trial. And he was he was questioned and, and challenged, and then he kind of sort of ran off, you know, sort of naked. So you've got this story which is unique to Mark. It's a little story. Now I, I know you, Eusebius said that Mark was um, Peter's interpreter, but I also think that 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 little verse is just unique to Mark. So he could have well been that young man. We don't know. So you, so you, no, but here's the problem you've got though. If, if Mark no? is not that young man, yeah, I don't know. I'm not right. saying that he was or that he wasn't, but what I'm saying is, we, we, Robin, it, it Robin, is, I don't know if you've been listening to the stream so far. Uh, look, you've been in the comments. If you want to have an objective conversation, we'll have an objective conversation. Yeah, I know, what Robin. I'm saying is, is that it is a possibility that that young man was Mark, and yeah. you're saying it's not. No, no, no. Okay? What I'm saying to you, Robin, 
you've been in the comments since the beginning of the stream. You've seen the other guy, Frank, who tried to bring Robin, uh, Mark as this naked guy. We yep. explained that Mark wasn't one of the 12, and it was sure. the 12 who were in the Garden of Josephine, and the guy got naked in the Garden of Josephine, not at the trial. No, he, he didn't. Got, he got... No, he didn't. No, he, he, no, it wasn't at the Garden of Gethsemane he got naked. He got naked at the trial. Was it? Yes. I thought it was in the yeah. garden. No, no. When they grabbed no. hold of him and his clothes came off and he yeah. ran off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It was, no, because it it, 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 it was um, similar to where sort of Peter was, you know, being be, be, being challenged. You know, like, see, sort of Peter was um, just kind of, sort of hanging around, around the background at the trial and then they challenged him and sort of Mark, Mark again, was, um, uh, you know, they sort of tried to grab him because they said, oh, I'm And why do you believe Mark was a naked young man? Well, look, I'm just saying, I'm just saying it is a possibility that he was that that young man and and uh yeah we don't know so when you're saying that mark was not an eyewitness what i'm saying is that because there is that fu that funny little verse in there that prop would only be of any significance to the author himself so he was sort of put that to verse in there otherwise what why if the eyewitness is told what if the non why peter told him that happened why does that have to be mark i don't understand that you, you believe mark is a scribe of peter according to sabius and uh, peter could have spoken about this naked man why does Mark have to be that? I don't. Why are you inserting the author into the story? Well, we don't know that sort of. Peter would have uh, seen that young man to run off. You know, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But all I'm saying is that you're saying that Mark was not a a. Um, there, it, it no, wasn't no, no. What we've done. Well. What we've done there were a in. whole lot of other followers of Jesus too. What I'm saying is that Mark could have could have well been there in the background. Anyhow, look, that's kind of a bit of a side issue. No, no, um, no. This is the main issue, Robin. This is the main <laughs> issue. Because well, if the authors of the Gospels are not eyewitnesses writing to, uh, historical events, I mean, for example, do you agree with uh, Frank um, that um, the, the authors of the Gospels paraphrase Jesus' words? Or do you believe they were verbatim? I think it's, um, I would say that some of it would be paraphrased and some of it would, would possibly be verbatim. We don't know. We, we can't say. Either, so either how way. would you so how do how can you then claim certain words were verbatim and quote well, them as Jesus said them? Okay, as I say, I sort of can't say that they are or that they aren't. But so but then the, it's very hard to build a theology the, on words that Jesus may or may not say. Okay, as I say, they they are um they are historical narratives written retrospectively. Okay, so 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 let's say Let's say Eusebius was right, and that actually sort of Mark's gospel was what Peter had dictated. So Peter was an eyewitness. Now, as far as Matthew was concerned, okay, Eusebius said Matthew wrote the Ligia. We know that the Ligia was written in Aramaic, and uh, and what that that Ligia was quite possibly an eyewitness account. So Matthew himself was a tax collector. So because he was a tax collector, he would have been literate, whereas some of the other disciples were 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 probably were were illiterate. Um, and that's why Peter then wrote, wrote his gospel. That's why Mark had to write it for him. John, um, similarly, he was a fisherman. Um, he may not have been used to sort of writing down much, could, may not have, have, have been able to read and write much. But as far as Matthew is concerned, Matthew being a tax collector, he would have at the end of the day been used to writing up accounts and all that sort of thing. So, so Matthew's Legia, uh, written in Aramaic, was, was, was probably a sort of diary account, a little bit like a ship's log, if you like. Um, and but what we have today why, why did Matthew copy from Mark? No, ah, but what we have today is, is, is in, in Matthew's gospel is a Greek manuscript, it's not an Aramaic manuscript. But there are certain verses in there which, um, or, or large passages in the gospel of Matthew that actually, if you that they're quite clumsy in their Greek style. But when you retranslate them back into Aramaic, they have a much greater flow to them. So, therefore, you've had some scribe that is later on interposed Mark's gospel or what's it say, said in Mark um, with a translation of Matthew's Legia into there. So, what I think is Matthew's Legia, for instance, if you like the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, was a uh, was a whole script that Matthew had written down and recorded as a sort of diary record. So you don't find the Sermon on the Mount in Mark's Gospel. I know, but why does no? But he copied seventy percent of Mark. Why was that? Okay, well, let's say that that is from some scribe that is later on actually sort of interposed Mark 
Mark's gospel with Matthew's Legia. I don't understand. Are you saying Matthew didn't copy 70% from Mark? No, what I'm saying is that it, 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 was, it, it was Matthew wrote his gospel account in Aramaic, or he wrote his Legia. Did he copy Aramaic. from Mark? So, no, you've had some later Greek scribe or some, some scribe that has interposed Matthew's Aramaic Legia onto the Gospel of Mark. And they've and, uh, and, and sort of put that whole sort of thing together. Imran, can you, uh, okay, Imran, can you address that, please? You seem to be saying that um, Matthew was originally in Aramaic and somebody translated it into Greek and they put in Mark in, most of Mark into it as well. So, because we know about seventy-five percent of Matthew is verbatim from Mark. Exactly. So, what that sure. would mean, what that would mean, is that most of Matthew is missing, because we only have twenty-five percent. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, not at all. No, because because we don't know what sort of Matthew we we don't know what Matthew's uh, Legia stated, but as I yeah. say, I think, or you know, so sort of my theory is that is that Matthew's Legia was picked up. Um, and translated from Aramaic and interposed into the Gospel of Mark, and that's why it's in in it's Mark's Gospel and the Legia that has so been put that together was, by, that by some case, scribe. It's, you know, Robin, if, I can, if I can just take that case, so if you were to have um, Matthew in uh, in Aramaic being translated into Greek, and then you have Mark's Gospel, and then you were to interpose, and you're essentially saying there were they were interpolated together, so they're combined together as opposed to one is written in the place of another, then we would what we would see is repetition of certain facts. Um, but we don't see that. We see an attempt at uh, bringing together a coherent timeline. So that would sure. mean that some, some the scribe then who was doing this translating and inter, interpolating would be removing some of the text from Matthew to put in Mark to make the story flow. So that would he would be essentially removing a lot of Matthew because we know seventy five percent of Mark is copied verbatim into Matthew, and that would when mean seventy five percent. I'm not quite sure where you sort of it's seventy five percent of it, it is not verbatim. If you like, the narrative is similar, but they are not verbatim. So I think if so, the the, the percentage varies from seventy five even higher to some people say even ninety uh, of of Mark in Matthew. Now, the, yeah, the, the okay, the, the, the themes, if you like, the, the sort of themes have been taken from 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 Mark's gospel. Word, word for word. Oh, they oh, they're definitely not word for word. Certainly, the, the, there may be small parts of it that would be word for word, but you know, the, the sort of bulk of it is a uh, you know has, has 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 definitely different wording. You know, even look at some, at things like um, the sort of parable of the sower. You know, they are very similar. But they're not ethnicity word for word. So, I don't know if you've if, if you ever seen a, a university student try to avoid plagiarism. Have you ever seen that happen, Robin? You know what they do? They <laughs> yeah. take they'll take the sentence, they'll take a few words from here, and yeah. then they'll make it their own. But what yeah. you can see when you look at it, actually, this is you know where this has come from, and this is someone's just put in a few words to make it their own. And this is essentially what we see when we look at Matthew. And we compare it to what's written in Mark. So yeah, the, sure. the transference is clear, sure. and this is where the seventy-five percent, because it's you're, you're right, they're not identical, but you can see that happening. Yeah. So what what the, would happen uh, now? Sure. Yep. Yep. What yep. would happen yep. now yep. in a university is they'd put your essay into Google, and everywhere where you copied it would just come up highlighted, and they know where that's come from. And essentially, yep. you can do the same thing with the manuscripts themselves. So. Yep. So that's I think that from the position that you're holding, it would show that most to me, it would appear that most of um, Matthew would be essentially missing because most of it is Mark. Well, no, um, you don't know that it's missing because we because uh, um, it may have it may have compiled all of Matthew's Legia. Matthew's Legia, may, his, his diary may not have been uh, uh, particularly big. OK, um, but then. You know, if there are parts that are missing, well, okay, they're just missing. They're sort of lost. You know, so what we have is 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 what that scribe chose to include in his account. And remember that these that these first century sort of scribes and writers and that they were just that, that they were just putting it in writing the story. They were sort of putting in the sort of narrative. They were putting in the the um, ideas, the the sort of things did this, that did uh, describe all the verbatim words of Jesus. Pardon. 
did this scribe know the verbatim words of Jesus? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that they were necessarily verbatim, but some parts of it okay. could, could have been verbatim. We Even from know. a scribe who wasn't there? Well, look, you, there's, there's kind of sort of various themes that are said, you know, like, see, we can look at, say, um, like, I don't know verbatim Martin, Martin Luther's famous speech, but I sort of do know that I, I can quote, you know, a sort of couple of little paragraphs or, you know, a couple of little sentences and, you know, from Martin Luther's speech. Yeah. But but you know if if if, if why, I was why do you guys I, jump away from the New Testament every time you get asked specifically about something within the New Testament we get all sorts of stuff except for what we've just asked. Yeah, no, I, think, no. I, think, I think we agree actually, Robin. You know, you we agree because what we've yeah, been we're saying. Yeah, we're with you. We're with you. The scribe, uh, he was writing his own words, and it's not reliable. Yeah. We get yeah. it. Yeah. Can I just so can I get something, Robin, if you don't mind? Because. Okay, um, so I'm just so reading the Gospel of Mark, Robin. I'm just reading the Gospel of Mark, and it was in the garden yep. where the naked man fled. It wasn't at the trial. Oh, was it? Okay. Oh, well, I, I can't. Mark. And when they seized like Jesus, sure, sure. then he fled naked. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay. Well, look. Just okay, correcting so, you on that because you corrected okay. me. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Well, I just checked it out when I was okay. right uh, as I thought it was. If, if that's what I said, yeah, I sort of thought it was at the uh, at the trial. All right. But, uh, yeah. Robin, can I can I suggest you do the same as Bradley, if you don't mind? Because I don't think you've watched the previous streams, have you? Um, I've, I've 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 only watched the first one because right. I was only made aware of this of, of 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 this talk yesterday. Right. What I need mm. you What I need you guys to do, all of you Christians who are watching, you as well, Robin. Yeah. You need to look at what we've said. Why we've challenged the historicity of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, of John. Yeah. 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 And then come back and tell us what we got wrong. Okay. Well, look. The reason why you right guys... now you're just telling us what you believe. Uh, no, and we've already what... refuted everything you've just said you believe, and no, we actually so agree I'm... with parts of what you say. Uh, pardon? We agree with you when you say it was a random scribe who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Yep. That you have yep. today. Yep. 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 Okay. Which I, which I would mean that. that the Gospel of Matthew is not written by a disciple of Jesus. No, but it doesn't mean to say that. That 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 the um, that that the story that, that the narrative and those things that are in there did not happen and were not said. No, but what it would do, it would explain the historical inaccuracies within it and the fabricated stories contained within it. That's what it would do. Well, you might sort of claim that they're sort of fabricated, but the thing is that. No, okay. we've demonstrated why the. That's what I'm saying to you, uh, Robin. Yeah, we've but, demonstrated, yeah, but... for example, we demonstrated why, um, for example, King Herod and the killing of the babies. And yep. Jesus fleeing and Joseph fleeing to Egypt with Jesus. Yeah, we've demonstrated how this historically didn't happen. Okay, yeah? and and okay. and the sister that uh, Ijaz was talking about earlier, you know, she told us that according to the, in Matthew, Herod died four years earlier. Yeah. So yeah, uh, but, and but so if you find sort of one or sort of two things that are wrong and incorrect, that doesn't mean to say that that a whole lot of you don't. Sort no, of no, throw no, no. What it means is oh, no, no, no. But what it does mean. And, and, and I think you've conceded this point, but many Christians don't. So what it, what it does mean is that if there's mistakes or fabricated stories in the Gospel of Matthew, then it isn't a reliable source of information. Oh, no. What it is, it is a historical document. And I say you've got to, it was written. No, no, but this the is the genre, point. It's not historical. In the it's genre that it was written. Oh, it, no, but if it's quoting things that didn't historically happen, it's not reliable. Okay, you might say, well, they're not reliable in maybe one or two verses. No, that, no, no uh, how do you know what is reliable? Well, you don't know necessarily that it is verbatim. You don't know that they're totally that that, that that it is totally what was actually said. But what you do know, what we do know, is that these these gospel accounts were written by um, four individuals, and there are contradictions that are in there. There are contradictions between those Gospels, but those contradictions actually, to me, prove that there was no collusion that was going on. So when, for instance, if you look at uh, the sign that was put above Jesus um, uh, by, by Herod saying, you know, this is, the, this is the king of Jews, or, you know, one says, you know, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. One says Jesus, king of the Jews. So they're sort of different writings that are on the sign. So those, so if you like, those contradictions of what was on the sign that Herod, that not not Herod, rather Pontius Pilate put on um, put, put put above Jesus. So those 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 different wording in there actually shows there was no collusion between the different writers. 
And you can also look at, for instance, when Jesus was supposed to be sort of crucified. You know, one says it was at, at you know the third hour. One said it was the sixth hour. You know, so so be, because there is a contradiction, those those show that there was no collusion. So therefore, they are valid. Those what? those differences actually actually those differences wouldn't be accepted in the court of law. Go on, validate. Go. They actually validate the authenticity of them. How does that evaluate um, things they uh, didn't know? Uh, Robin, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. So I uh, I saw you in the chat earlier, and I've listened patiently to most of the things that you've said. Um, would I be wrong in assuming that you hold to some of the more classical positions on who the authors were? So, for example, I noticed that you were referencing Papias, as Papias was referenced by Eusebius. And you were satisfied generally that the, uh, the the normative narrative is generally accurate and it holds up, even though you may allow for like some scribal activity. Generally, most of your views I would consider uh, conservative. Would that not be correct based on the sure. authorship yep. statements? Yep. 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 Mm. Okay. So one yep. of the like one of the things I try to do is uh, uh, I'm going to read a quotation from you from. Uh, a very early church father, you've heard of Origen, nonetheless, I would assume. Yes, sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this yep. is what Origen writes, and uh, this is quoted in the book um, uh, by Professor Dale C. Allison Jr., The Historical Christ and the Theological Jesus. So he quotes Origen as saying, the evangelists sometimes altered things which from the eye of history occurred otherwise. They could speak of something that happened in one place as if it happened in another, or of what happened at a certain time, as if it had happened at another time. And they introduced into what was spoken in a certain way, some changes of their own. And his uh, final quote here, the spiritual truth was often preserved, one might say, in the material falsehood. Now, if you want a uh, God well in, uh, after the stream, if you send us an email, I can uh, find a way to get this reference to you. Or if you go to callingchristians.com, the reference is, is there in the article I'm reading from. Now, what would be your response uh, as a Christian? Okay, so, so, so Oregon for a start, okay, Origin. he was, uh, you know, he, he lived about 160 AD um, to mm -hmm. about 210 or whatever it is, you know, sort mm -hmm. of late in the late second century. Um, so, and he was a, um, you know, I, I, I actually quite like a lot of what Oregon said. Um, and his sort of thinking. Um, I know he was a non-Trinitarian, and I'm not a Trinitarian either, um, in the strict sense of what a Trinitarian is. Um, and a lot of Oregon's writings were actually destroyed by um, after Eusebius and that because of his uh, his non-Trinitarian point of view. So we only have certain things that that have been we've been able to, to have recovered from what Oregon wrote. Um, and uh, but yeah, so I can't say. You know whether Oregon, what he's wrote there, you know, is it, it was his opinion. Um, but you've got to remember that he 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 was around a hundred years after after uh, you know one hundred and thirty years, one hundred and forty years after he was born. Now, what I did here in in uh, in that first uh, episode of you, you were talking, and I'd like to um, to bring that up um, specifically with you. Just just one second. Like I just want to finish this portion of, of the. Um, one second, oh, Robin. Yeah, yep. I wanted to finish on this section before we move on to a different point. Yep. The, the reason I bring this up is I find it curious that you brought Origen's age into the equation, like how long after he lived. But a lot of the narrative that we get about who the authors were primarily come from Irenaeus and Tertullian, living about the sure. exact same yep. time as Origen. Yes, so yes. I just find it a bit confusing how, on the one hand, you prefer to disagree with what you consider it to be Origen's opinion, when really and truly he is no less authoritative than any of the authors at his own time. One might argue he's even earlier uh, than Irenaeus and uh, 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 Tertullian in their writings. So how do you reconcile this mismatch, it seems to be to me? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, what I would have to say in honesty is that I don't know whether whether origin is right or wrong. You know, would, he, it, would it affect your belief in the gospels if he indeed is right? Um, 
my belief in the gospels uh, uh, accounts are i would think that there's a, a verse in the new testament which which speaks about the uh the spirit of the prophet being subject to the prophet himself basically what it means is that is that if you get a prophetic word you see it through the lens that you understand it to be so the different gospel writers they they and and the scribes that put it to that that, that put the gospels to, uh that put matthew together anyway but certainly and certainly luke looks a little bit different um but let's say going back to matthew that scribe may have sort of put in their things as he saw it and understood it um, so it is, it is done through the lens. So what origin is so, which is basically what you're saying there, as far as the origin is concerned. He's saying that 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 the uh, gospel writers kind of uh, put their particular spin on things. That's really what he's saying, mm -hmm. isn't it? So you know, the reason I bring this up is because you you mentioned earlier that you know the gospels fall under the category of historical works, right? They are works that uh, include some element of history in them. But here is where I disagree. Uh, at least as far as I understand it, the genre under which the Gospels fall under is a, a, a bio, uh, biographies, basically. Yes. But it's yes. not any kind of biography. It's specifically to a Greco-Roman biography. And I think that when we throw out the word historical, we've got a bit of a mismatch here because our modern people, as we understand history, we think that it's meant to be objective and detailed. But when we speak of a Greco-Roman history, would you not accept, for example, the literary device of Ipsissima or Vox, that you can write in someone's voice, attribute quotes to them, and as long as you believed that this was, that this is something that they could have reasonably said, then it's fine to attribute that quote to them. This is part and parcel of Greco-Roman bio I writing. So, we, so would sure. you accept then that sure. what I've just yep. mentioned? Yep, 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 yep. absolutely, absolutely. And, and if, for, if, for instance, we, we should look at the sort of prologue at the beginning of John, of mm -hmm. John's gospel, you know, that's, that's all narrative. That's all kind of sort of John's sort of narrative. That's the way that he kind of sort of sees it and, and perceives his reality. But then he kind of goes into, you know, certain accounts. He goes into the sort of the miracle at the wedding of Cana. There's, you know, he talks about the woman at the well. There's a whole lot of different, different kind of sort of stories that he brings in. But he kind of interposes that with his own particular narrative that he sort of brings out. Yeah, but Robin, I'm, I'm not trying so much to get to the idea that there are distinct authors that we can identify, but more so I'm trying to draw the point that the very body of literature that we're looking at does not speak to any one individual being that author writing from their particular lens. I'll give an example, right? Because we, I think you mentioned the gospel according to Luke earlier. It's known that at the time of Luke, that is the temple, sorry, the template rather that he uses for the start of his gospel is the very same template that Dios Corvidas' famous book on the history of medicine used. Right, it's writing mm -hmm. to a friend, accounting to everything from uh, accounting about everything from the very start, doing it carefully, and others have attempted, but they've not been successful in this regard. So we know what the author of Luke is dependent upon, mm -hmm. but we can't know, for example, that Luke did write this information. This is uh, something that uh, I feel as if we have like skipped over in the discussion. I think Hamza did try to bring it back to that point earlier. But so it seems to me you want to trust the tradition as Irenaeus lays it out as to who the authors of the Gospels could be, but you seem to dismiss the idea that even at the time that it's meant to be written, that they were not borrowing from a template and therefore the information in it does not have to be authentic in the first place. You can use a template to create anything like a job letter or a recommendation or a CV. It doesn't necessarily mean that because you've used those words and phrases, they're meant to be authentic. How do you reconcile your quote unquote liberal take on the New Testament? Well, when by and large, you mix what is a mishmash of conservative ideas and then you presuppose them into discussion. That, at least that's what I've noticed that you've done with Brother Hamza and Imran. And it right. okay. Yeah. okay, like, I don't think that the Bible is a magical book. Mm -hmm. 
okay i should don't think that so that the gospels are magical they are written they are written as genuine authentic um historical retrospective biogra biographies with a particular with, with a bigger meta narrative and the and and the fact that um the the sort of bulk of them the main themes are consistent between them um you know you do have some small peculiarities but the main themes are consistent between them basically validifies the fact of jesus and who he was what he said what he did and what happened to him but Robin, we're say for instance we're say for instance all you guys would sort of uh would would try to dismiss those four gospel accounts or those records of jesus being crucified and being and resurrected because because you believe in the meta narrative of the quran that the quran robin, is robin 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 is, is, robin, is, robin. Is the infallible thing you're parking up the wrong tree mate you, this you is not how we to be this. objective you fail well, robin, in your objectivity i'm objective robin, you fail to be objective robin robin that's unfair because for one you haven't watched our streams you haven't seen how we've approached it i've only, I've only seen the first one I've right only right, seen right. so then you can't make it you can't then say we've done this and we've done that based on this and based on that when you haven't watched the stream no, only based on the first one that i've seen okay so none of this has come from the quranic narrative we never not not one of these things we've approached from a quranic narrative not one Okay. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So sure. let me ask you a question then, because I, I, I like what you're saying about the, the gospel. I, I like it. All right. So do you think, as a Christian, you can quote from those gospels words that Jesus spoke as if Jesus actually said those words? I can, if I was to quote them, I'd, I'd be making a statement of faith. So right, so you couldn't quote down. them and say, Jesus said this so and it, Jesus it, said it, that. It, 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 it would be i could say for instance okay jesus said um you know i am the true bread that came down from heaven or i am the gate or you know so those kind of sort of quotes if you like from john's gospel um uh are, are really interesting and i could we could probably go down that that's a rabbit hole for for uh, you know for a couple of hours well i'll show you it's not a rabbit hole i'll show you it's like a one foot hole yeah so basically um if jesus said he's a bread of life which is a very profound statement, the bread from heaven, manna from heaven and such, then yeah. the other gospels would have recorded this because people would have been re reporting what Jesus said because it's no, such a profound statement. No? No, 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 no so not necessarily. Because you know, Jesus, even, not seen it, this to, Jesus said these words to multitudes, did he not? Because G, look, it, it, even John at the end of at the end of his gospel, he says, look, look, and there's sort of so many other things that I could have kind of sort no, of. No, no, forget know, what John's said. saying. I'm saying to you. Did Jesus say these words? He's a bread of life, manna from heaven, to crowds. Um, I'm reasonably happy to accept that. Yes. Right. Yet no one in this crowd bothered to inform Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Jesus said these words. In the no. same and the same event is recorded in those gospels. So the most yeah. profound things Jesus said, nobody prior to John recorded it or spoke about it. Yeah. Okay. So again, if you look at what Eusebius records, how, uh, what John put in his gospels, John put in his gospels, in his gospel, things that had been omitted and left out of the previous ones that have been written. No, but this is the point. You see, why would the people not be reporting that Jesus claimed to be the bread of life if he said it to crowds? Well, look. The why were the, the Pharisees the, not going mad the, about this? The early Christians um in, in in that when john wrote his gospel account okay it was in the you know 60 70 years 80 years after jesus lived okay so um maybe not 60 sorry uh, 40 to 60 years after um so if we look at the uh paul's writings um and what and and his understanding, his understanding of Jesus, you you can't kind of sort of divorce the well, gospel. Well, first thing, first thing, sorry. Paul never met Jesus. Paul was not an eyewitness of Jesus. No, Paul never right. witnessed any of Jesus' statements or miracles. So please, Paul's irrelevant in this point. You're claiming well, John is a witness. No, right? no, Paul is very relevant because Paul was a companion of Luke. Did Paul witnessed Jesus addressing the crowds. No, but Paul, Paul obviously. Right, right. So the point, so the point of Paul is. Eyewitnesses. But Robin, Robin, Robin. You're claiming John. Eyewitnesses. You're claiming John is recording something Jesus said. 
Yet nobody before that reported Jesus saying these profound statements. Nobody. Yeah. yeah. Look, look, Mark, Ma Mark's gospel is what, 16 chapters? Um, Matthew's is 28 chapters. Luke's okay. is 24 so, so, so chapters. So what you're saying is... They, 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 they wrote down what... Um, that they wrote down retrospectively what they had recalled and uh didn't luke, the, didn't luke speak to the eyewitnesses they weren't they they weren't um what's the word they weren't eternal they oh, weren't no but, no, but did of, luke speak to the eyewitnesses yes 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 I right right that, right so the eyewitnesses luke, would have heard jesus say he's the bread of life manna from heaven or not um some of the yeah sure those yeah so, yeah but luke never recorded those, that so Luke never Somewhere. recorded that. Yep. So here's the thing you've got to work out, yeah, because you were right. Some of it was said, some of it wasn't said. And when you hear Jesus saying so many things in the Gospel of John that he's never said anywhere else before in history, apart until this particular Gospel, and we mm -hmm. know that these writings are hearsay from eyewitnesses who witness these events, and the events in the Gospel of John where Jesus claims to be the bread of life, that event occurs in the Gospel of Matthew, that event occurs in the Gospel of Mark, and that event occurs in the Gospel of Luke. So historically that event occurs... Yet nobody recalls Jesus saying these profound statements that he makes in the Gospel of John. So the only logical conclusion must be John has made that up. Because someone else would have been talking about it. Because it's such a profound statement. The Jews would have been going mad. Yeah? Yet we don't hear well, no, nothing about it. But but when you actually look what John what in, in, in John's Gospel, the Jews did go mad. They were really angry at no, him. No, no, no. Of course they did. They went mad in the Gospel yeah. of John because Jesus yeah. was making profound statements. But they're not going mad in the Gospel of Mark or Matthew or Luke because Jesus didn't make these profound statements. Of now, course if you're saying they Jesus, were. No, wait, just, Robin, 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 just listen, please. Of course If Jesus they made these profound statements in history, then the people would have been reporting that Jesus said these words. And when Paul, sorry, when Luke spoke to the eyewitnesses, they would have said, yeah, Jesus said such and such a thing. Because if they didn't say that, now you've got another problem. Maybe they weren't eyewitnesses. No, if we look for either the eyewitnesses if, admitting if, the most profound statements of Jesus, you've asked me a question. You've asked me a question. Okay, and so so, so let me answer it. What was my question? Okay, you 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 you're asking me whether uh um you know how come these you know these other guys didn't 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 mention don't these guys th these sayings yeah the don't forget these guys writers. okay no, Robin, the Robin. other writers don't okay, paraphrase me. me why don't the other writers me. just listen Robin Pardon? before you respond. Don't paraphrase me. I'll say it again to you so you know exactly what I'm saying. These guys are not eyewitnesses. These guys are reporting from eyewitnesses. Okay? These eyewitnesses. Luke does. Yes. Right, Luke right, right. Does. These eyewitnesses but not witness. Mark. Not Mark. Robin, Robin. Because, Robin. Because, because, because we have established before that sort of Mark wrote at Jesus. At, at, Robin, at, Robin, at Jesus let me establish my position. Peter was an eyewitness. Robin, Peter was let me establish my position and then you can respond to it. But okay. respond to what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So this is this is my biggest puzzle about this whole thing we've done so far. I said this right at the beginning of the stream. We've ascertained through all of our streams that the authors of the gospels, they themselves were not eyewitnesses. For example, Mark was not there at the birth of Jesus. Mark was not there with John the Baptist. Matthew wasn't there at the birth of Jesus to know the birth narrative. Okay, we know this for a fact. Right. So it's eyewitness their testimony they're taking from. Okay. So the mm -hmm. people in the time were reporting, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. Luke himself went to people, were you an eyewitness? Bear in mind they're talking 40 years after the event. You remember what happened 40 years ago, mate. But anyway, nevertheless, they went to eyewitnesses to find out what happened. Now, in the Gospel of John, in an event that occurs in all of the other Gospels, so this apparent event happened in history, nobody reports Jesus making profound statements like he's the bread of life, on all of these things, okay? We don't find it anywhere. We only find it when it comes to John. Now, yep. my question is this. Yep. If Jesus yep. said this historically, why is nobody prior to the Gospel of John talking about it? Okay. As I said to you, John was or was aware what the other Gospels writers had put in there, and that's why he puts in all these statements. He puts in miracles you don't find in other Gospels. You've done it the wrong he, way around, mate. The question is no. why have the other Gospels omitted it? Well, I don't know why they omitted it. Like, see, they, uh, they, Could, yeah. Can I just I, I phrase it another way? Yeah, Aaron, Aaron, please, please, do it nicely. I'm asking it roughly. You do it nicely. I just want to, I just want to phrase the question because I think it's a quite an important one, Robin. So imagine, I want you to just imagine this scenario that you're you're listening to a, a, a an important person give a speech. There's a crowd of people amongst you. 
and the person says, I'm going to give everybody here a million dollars. Okay, mm -hmm. and then he carries on with the speech. The speech is an hour long. Mm -hmm. The thing that everyone's going to remember is, I'm going mm -hmm. to give everyone a million dollars. That's yeah. You're not going to forget that, right? Yeah. Now, I am the bread of life is the equivalent statement to I'm going to give you a million dollars. It's a claim to divinity. This is how it's portrayed. Right? Sure, sure. And for the Jewish audience who are listening, for the people around, they would have that would have been the thing that they're never going to forget in that whole statement. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that we have is we have gospel writers writing this down who don't mention that I'm going to give you a million dollars part of the speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the problem we have, not, not that... John records it. It's just that the other seventy-five percent of the writers don't record it. Mm. So then we then mm. we're left with a, a quandary, and the quandary, as Hans, Hans, uh, Brother Hans is putting it, is either John is remembering something that the other guys forgot, which is unforgettable, or actually it didn't happen, which is why the majority of people didn't write it, and John has added it as an embellishment. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what you seem to be saying is that John looked at the other gospels and yep. he selectively wrote down because initially remember in, initially you said i'm writing these were selectively write down. Biographical recordings independent biographical recordings but john but you now you seem to be saying that john was he looked at the Indeed. other gospels and said oh, they've missed this out and but i'm going to add it in yes. but how yeah. the question is how can you miss out the most important statement within a speech and he just well, and not just respect robin you said there was no collusion yeah, no, a whole lot statement so, 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 sorry, Hamza. I said earlier you said there was no collusion, which makes them valid. Then, if John yes. is writing things that the other writers didn't write, that's collusion. No, it's not. No, no it's not. Right. Anyway, answer him, Rand. Collusion don't. is when you get together and kind of sort of into, to sort of fabricate the story. All right. Okay. All right. Anyway, just to respond to the doctor because he he put it beautifully what I said. So why didn't yeah. the other gospel writers write down? I'm going to give you a million pounds. If you look and why at the people the, talking about that, if if you look at it and sort of read the synoptic gospels, so they tend to the, the, the there's there's a lot of um, thing about miracles um, that happened, events that happened. Um, there's a lot of parables in there, a lot of stuff that was parables. So it was stuff that that if you like the eyewitnesses um, could reflect on, they remember those stories. Um, and uh, there are certain things that, uh, for instance, in Matthew's gospel that he sort of brings out um, statements of Jesus, like, for instance, he said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must, you know, um, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know, he that will seek to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will, will save it. You know what's what 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 does it profit if a man you know gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? So there are certain things that these guys sort of put in, which and we don't find, for instance, John sort of um, repeating that statement. So we oh, uh, yeah. that's I don't want to derail. I don't want to derail you, Robin. But what did that mean to pick up your cross? What would well, they have understood that to mean? Well. Again, even the word cross, I didn't even know, even know it was a cross. It could be stake. It's basic it means to sort of take up the burden, if you like. You know, that that's the way I should have seen it. So Jesus didn't say take up your cross. Um, as I say, the word cross is is um, is, is is one that uh, it, it, it can also mean stake in the actual Greek word that we find. It. And and, and uh, yeah, so it's, what it's that, not. What, what, what would cross. they believe that to mean? Because they, they, at this point, I'm pretty sure they would, they would not. Jesus okay. wasn't told they were going to be crucified. To sort of take up your load, to sort of take up the burden. Okay, that's what it means. Okay. Okay. And so the word. Okay, the cross. Anyway, going back to what we said, you, you've you've ignored exactly okay. what we said. The, one of the most no, profound no, statements that Jesus but, said that he's going to give everyone a million dollars. Yeah. And but, but everyone I'm, else is admitted to write it. Yeah, but I'm also saying that that of equal importance, for instance, is what the gospel, what what the synoptical synoptic gospels did put in there which was to take up your cross and follow me you know um you know he who uh um you know tries to gain the whole world you know yet loses his soul you know gains nothing so Robin. you've got you've you've got these these important verses that you do find and sayings of jesus that you do find you're ignoring the, the, you're ignoring the question that john does not repeat you're avoiding so the question he doesn't, repeat, he doesn't need to repeat those things you're avoiding the question so what he does is he puts in there things that 
that the other gospel writers hadn't said, which were important to note. What was the most important thing to know, according to the Gospel of John, about Jesus I, being the bread of life and manna from heaven? Yeah, okay. So that, Right, so, so Jesus that was, said that. that Jesus an, said that. That was an important thing that... If that, Jesus that, that, said those words, the people would have been talking about it, wouldn't they? Yes, they did. Right. Uh, well, and the people, no, no, no. And if the people were talking... Certainly the Jews didn't like it. So why... So, so why No, Robin, you're missing Jews? the point, you see. If Jesus said those words, the people would have been talking about it. And the eyewitnesses would have told Luke that Jesus said these words. And the eyewitnesses would have reported to Mark and Matthew that Jesus said these words. Now, the point we have is that this should have been this would have been world news uh, in that area. Yeah, Jesus says he's claiming to be God, right? We don't yeah. find anything. Yeah? yeah, we only find it in the Gospel of John. So sure. if Jesus said such a profound statement, again, repeating the same question, why did no why was nobody before the Gospel of John talking about it? Well, as I said, those were the, the, the things that were written in the synoptic gospels were the recollections of that that those people's. Uh, um, so you're saying those eyewitnesses who were there when Jesus did these said these words didn't hear those words. Were they there? Um, again, we don't know. Actually, well, if they weren't there, were there, then okay, all right. So if they weren't there, uh, how how can they then tell Luke what happened? Well, big. Because Luke, if, 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 for, if for instance we look at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we um, we find the whole story about Mary and you know her story. No, no, no. Say it again but, to you. If if you're saying now those people were not there when Jesus said these profound statements at this particular event, then how can Luke write about that event if the people who were telling him were not there? Um, because some of the people wouldn't have been there. Right, so then, then you can't say Luke got his information from eyewitnesses about that event, then, can you? No, but no, but Luke got his eyewitnesses on of the things that he writes about. So no, but Luke so, writes about this. Luke, Luke writes about this event, but just not these particular words. Which event? I just want to ask. Yeah, you yeah, Daniel's been patient. Daniel, Robin, it's been a pleasure. A time, so <laughs> can I just ask you one thing, though, Robin? Please. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah. You've said some things today that I don't think you realise the ramifications of. And yeah. I think you should reflect upon it, honestly. Okay. Because if you, you yourself are admitting this may not be verbatim, this may not be the actual words of Jesus, and yet your theology is built upon these, uh, these very words. Sure. Yeah? Sure. So that's sure. what you need to question. Why are you believing this thing is true? Okay. Because Just reflect upon that. That's all I ask. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just ask you one question before you go. Yep. Um, and this is unrelated to the topic, which is why I left it at the end. So uh, can a non-Christian... Have the Holy Spirit within them? Um, they can be touched by the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's all I want to know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Take care, Robin. Okay. Well, thank you, Robin. Come again. And Thanks for coming on, mate. I will come have back. Good day. Come on. Yeah, it'll be good. Later, see you later, mate. It was very nice to have Robin on. I think for that was fascinating, and and I think he agreed with everything that we've been saying essentially. Honestly. Um, and. But actually, he says that he believes these statements by faith. Now, one of the things that was quite sad for me, really, is, uh, is this idea that he gave about the only way to understand the Bible is if you have the spirit within you. And what that does is it takes away the reason for revelation in the first place. Revelation is meant to be for, for mankind to have a look at the, you know, the information and then accept the, you know, the, the narrative that happened and you go from there. And I think it's quite sad that because because the position is before you can believe you have to believe and that's really hard to uh it's hard to do but anyway it's really nice talking to robin he's a nice guy i hope you have him yeah again. yeah definitely i just i just wish these christians because they're saying such things and they don't seem to be aware of the ramifications of what they're saying yeah one two and that's really that's the that's the sadness they've conceded that it's like it's not historical it may not have been said but then you just, you built your theology upon it anyway okay. daniel What's going on? How's it How going? Bro? Hi, Daniel. Thank you for waiting. We really appreciate that. It's okay. Uh, the, thing, this is, the thing I have uh, a problem with you, obviously, I we have uh, uh, a disagreement with Christians, right? Both of us. But the thing is that when when we address the, the the gospel, I'm aware that there is a lot of contradictions 
for example, Luke, I, I, I don't trust in, in Luke at all. I, I have said that before. Uh, but the thing is, like, for example, Matthew. The thing is, why why uh, Matthew didn't didn't uh, wrote that down, wrote that words of th th those profound words of of, of Yeshua or yeah, Yeshua, Yahushai, doesn't matter. Jesus. Uh, why he don't wrote down those words if, if they were so profound, like? That's that's not it it it, it, it obviously, obviously brings some questioning, right? Like why not, right? But to uh to eliminate uh a history just by that particular statement, I I, I don't know. I find it like not not a good argument, Hamza. Do you understand what we were eliminating? If I understand? Do you understand what we were you eliminating? What we, I, I, I didn't get that. Okay, you said you don't see how that thing can eliminate, yeah? yeah. Do you understand what point that was eliminating? Mm. Well, the are you not eliminating that uh, that gospel? Which gospel? For example, John or Matthew? No, what, what we're saying is this. If John is recording historical events, why has nobody else wrote about those historical events when everybody else was getting their information from eyewitnesses and Jesus uh, did this in front of crowds? And if he's making such profound statements, we find it strange that nobody else spoke about these profound statements until I, we get to the gospel of John. The only conclusion you can get is Jesus didn't make these profound statements, hence people would have been talking about them. And and and, and that that's where I disagree because is that true? What what he's stating is what true? That he's the that he represents the 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 bread of life. The whole point is we don't even know if he's saying it. Okay, okay, I I, I understand your position, but to say it didn't happen. I think it's not uh, uh, a good argument. Who, who, who would know if it, Okay. I, he Daniel, Daniel, I'll make it simple for you. Who would know if Jesus said those words? Who would know? The disciples? No, the eyewitnesses. The crowds. Oh, of, of course, but yeah. I, I, I'm telling you, like, who were... No, 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 I'm saying to you, you're saying, you're saying I'm saying he didn't say it. What I'm saying to you, Daniel, is the crowds who Jesus spoke to would know if he said those words, wouldn't they? Yeah. Right. And what a point we're making is nobody prior to the Gospel of John mentioned this. Nobody. This, this is the thing. You're comparing. You're, you're when when you are analyzing the the, the, the four Gospels in in a in a like taking all the instance together just to analyze. No, 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 no. Everybody. We're not doing that, Daniel. Daniel, we're not doing that. What would, we've already established that the authors of the gospel, they themselves were not eyewitnesses. They got eyewitness testimony from eyewitnesses, apparently. So if, if Jesus is doing these, say, making these profound statements, the eyewitnesses would be reporting Jesus making such profound statements. But we find that the eyewitnesses did not inform Matthew, Mark or Luke that Jesus made such profound statements. And it should have been news throughout the, throughout the borough, throughout the area. Jesus is claiming to be the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven. He's claiming to be God. As the Jews reacted in the Gospel of John, we should see this. We don't find this in history. This is the problem. So if we don't find it until we get to the Gospel of John, then we have to question whether this event occurred. Because if it did occur, the people 100% would have been talking about it. Just as the example, as Imran said, if Jesus made a speech and he promised everyone a million dollars, the one thing everyone would remember about that speech is the million dollars. And anybody reporting that speech would mention the million dollars. And the point being made is that speech is mentioned in the other three Gospels, but there's no mention of the million dollars. So the question needs to be asked, did Jesus actually say a million dollars? Because it appears in history, according to the eyewitness testimony, he didn't. And once that happens, then you have a fabricated speech put into the mouth of Jesus that he never said in the Gospel of John. 
once you have that, now we've got a problem with that gospel because what else has been inserted into the mouth of Jesus he never said? That's the problem you have. Oh, I don't have any problem. Uh, I know but, you don't, mate. <laughs> the, what, I'm, what I'm telling you is you can, you can not have like, let, let me rephrase that. Uh, you are taking Luke as a real, uh, or not as a real, uh, like as a valid uh, piece of, of evidence because you, you don't believe in, in that uh, also, right? You don't believe in Luke, of course. But the thing is that you are comparing John with Luke that is false and with uh, Mark that we don't know who wrote that, right? The thing is that we don't have to trust in Luke or Mark, like to, to say uh, they 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 get the, te the testimony of eyewitnesses, right? And they wrote it down. Man, they wrong. Luke deliberately wrote. Why is John not wrong? What? Why is John not wrong? He could be wrong because. This is this is the thing. We have we, we have some errors. So John could be wrong. Like for, for example. No, no, John could be wrong, you're saying. John 6 4. No, John No no, could John be wrong? We have to test it. No, but could he be wrong? If he if he's the, 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 the apostle? No. No, can the can the author of the gospel of John be wrong? Like I was I'm telling you. If he is the apostle, for real, it's not wrong. Well, he couldn't be wrong. Couldn't be wrong. Right. So how would you know if he was the apostle for real? That's where we have to we have to address the... All right. The, uh, Let's say he was an apostle of Jesus. Yes. Let's say he was the apostle of Jesus. Yeah. Would he have made things up about Jesus? what Jesus said? No. Right. So if we have him, to, if we have him telling things that Jesus said that nobody else in history reports Jesus saying, do you not think he, the the question marks then hang over John? Okay, Are you but, making this up, mate? Okay, but what instances we're asking? What what is what it, what instances we're looking for? Like you you're telling me that nobody knows uh, knew about this. Who is this nobody? No, I didn't say that. I said nobody is reporting that Jesus is equal himself to God. Yeah, no one's okay. saying that. When you when you saying that nobody, who are, yeah. who are you referring to? The eyewitnesses in the crowd who Jesus spoke to. They wrote. No, they witnessed. Okay, but how do you know if they wrote or not? No, no, no. They didn't write. They informed the other gospels what happened. So, the, the thing is, what's the reaction of the crowd at that moment? What? Depends what? on the gospel you read. John. No, 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 but they, this is the problem you've got, you see. You're throwing, the, or, you're throwing the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke under the bus because you want John to be true. No, no, no. I, you are. In fact, 100 in fact you are. I, I believe 100% in Matthew, not in John. All right, so where did Matthew report Jesus saying these profound statements? That's what I'm telling you. What are you telling me? That that doesn't like, for example, I don't know, man. <laughs> right, but it doesn't make sense, does it? It, it? it doesn't make sense that that. Uh, Do you think if Jesus said those words, Matthew would have said it? Jesus said those words. Let, let me let me answer first uh, this. It doesn't make sense that uh, Moses op opened the. Uh, please, please don't go. No, 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 Daniel, Daniel, don't do that. No, 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 that, no, no, no. That, Moses has got nothing to do with this, mate. Stay good, on point. Does it make point. sense? Does <laughs> it make sense that Matthew would admit Jesus saying these profound words? Does it make sense if Matthew's an eyewitness? Does it make sense? Why wouldn't Matthew report that? The thing is that we in the scriptures, right? Okay, let, let, let me let me put it like this way. It could be that Matthew uh, was told just record that th this kind of events. 
what and ignore the most profound statements Jesus made. Remember yeah. one thing. Yes. Remember one yeah. thing. Daniel, uh, Daniel, uh, it's, it's Daniel, it's Daniel. Uh, remember one thing. The okay. Gospel of John was written 40 years after Matthew. So you're saying to me, the people who were around in the, where the Gospel know. of Matthew was written. I don't know where. Daniel, well, Daniel, Daniel. You know for sure. Daniel, Daniel. Just pay attention. Focus. Okay. No, focus. We know that the Gospel of John was written 40 years, 40 years, or maybe 30 years after the Gospel of Matthew. All right. How do you know? How do you know? What, what's your, what's your, uh, uh, your, your sources. For, well, when for, do you believe the Gospel of John was written? What? When do you believe the Gospel of John was written? I don't know. Right, so you're I'm just not, trying I'm to get, again, you're just I'm making claims not, to support your narrative. I'm, I'm Christian, scholarship, Christian scholarship uh, dates the Gospel Christian of John to about the 1990s. Christian doesn't know anything, brother. All right, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Yeah. I, I think you've had a long night, mate. You look tired, yeah? Relax. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let the Christians come on, man. No, no, let, no. Give them a chance to defend their scripture. Because it's not fair. You're not a Christian. You're coming on, and you and you can't defend the Christian position. But I think I... Neil thinks he can. So let's give Neil a shot. If we still got time, we'll bring you back. But I think you you look tired, bro. We'll get your head down. No, 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 no. Honestly, Hamza, you're not answering my my position. Neither. What's your position? All right. And what's your position? Okay. First of all, you you're telling me uh, John was written. Uh, 40 years, yay! <laughs> That's a past life. I found him. I found him. <laughs> my, past. <laughs> my Spanish could be wrong, that, that, but that means easy money, yeah? Dinero yeah, for yeah. sale. That, that was my, last, <laughs> my last movie before retiring. Okay. Wow, you're an actor. Oh, uh, yeah, and a filmmaker. But that's... So, is this actually your accent, or are you putting this on for us? You'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, we can't hide behind that because if he's a Hebrew Israelite, he has to be Hispanic or black. Yeah, oh, true. So you're Hispanic, so he's not putting it on now. <laughs> okay, okay, Hamza, Hamza, you're telling me John was was written four years after. Say twenty years after the Gospel of Matthew. How do you know? What's your sources? If Jazz, can you explain to uh, Daniel why we believe that the, the authorship of the gospel, according to the Christian scholarship, but give him an idea of why we believe that. Why we believe what? I was when the gospel of John was written. Uh, uh, Christian, Christian scholars Christian, argue. Christians don't believe that we have to obey the Torah. Please. See, this is the problem we have, you see. He asked for us why we believe this thing. We bring people who've studied the manuscripts and the, the writings of the church fathers and all of this stuff. And the first thing you say, Daniel, don't believe what they say. So why ask for it? Okay, okay. okay. Here's what. Let's bring Daniel back into the conversation. We got Neil uh, Pomalia. Uh, so let Neil come on now and Pomalia. try to position. Yeah. So Daniel, don't go away. We're going to try yeah, and bring you back around. into the conversation. Yeah, I, I want to discuss your uh, movie career. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds interesting. I think we should start a new stream on that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Daniel, it's always a pleasure, you know what I mean? And like I said, get ready to be a Muslim, inshallah, you're not far. Uh, let's see what Neil's got to say. Hey, you guys, can you hear me? Hi, oh, Neil. Yeah. yeah, thank you yeah, for waiting. Neil. How are you doing, mate? Hey, thanks. Uh, man, that guy, when he said, yeah, how Is your camera I... working, Neil? Uh, it's, 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 it is, but I'm keeping my phone in my pocket. I'm walking around outside. Okay, Just turn the sound enough. up a little bit, if you don't mind. Oh, oh, sure, one second. All right, how about now? Is it working now? Yeah. Yep. It's well, okay. Oops, sorry for the loud noise in the background. That guy said, yeah, how is shy? And I thought, okay, this guy's a Hebrew Israelite. Is he trolling? Or no, no, he no, he's a good guy. He's, he's, yeah. he's, okay. he's on his way to being a Muslim. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I could, yeah, I and he tell. knows it. And he knows it. Yeah, uh, even I know that one. <laughs> so uh, for some reason, I can't hear much I'm background not, noise now. I'm not, um, I'm, not, I'm not going to be a Muslim. Okay. Sure. Okay. So anyway, so the objection. Ne never say never. Uh, never here. say never. Uh, I said that, that word because. Same here. I said that once. <laughs> Honestly, I said I'll never be a Muslim. <laughs> Nineteen right. years later. Go on, Neil. Sorry. Go on. Right. So here's how right. the format okay, I can't wait works, till Neil. Become a so, Christian, so. Neil, Neil. Let's, 
it, it, here's how the format works, right? Um, we've put forward our position as to why we don't believe the, uh, the so far the Gospels are a reliable source of information. And the way this works is this. You address something we've said that you think we're wrong about or bring something new to the table that supports the idea that the uh, Gospels are a reliable source of historical information. Sure. Okay. So I heard you saying that you believe that the Gospel according to St. John um, has a bunch of false quotes from Jesus in there. Is that correct? Because the other writers do not quote them? No, no. What I'm saying, I'll, I'll repeat myself because that was you paraphrased okay. it, man. And I know it's the New Testament, but please don't paraphrase me. All right. What sure. I said was this. If Jesus made the profound statements that we find in the Gospel of John, and he said these profound statements to the crowds, and the previous Gospels, the synoptics, were written by men who were informed by eyewitnesses as to what occurred, the question that's being raised is, why did nobody tell, none of these eyewitnesses informed the authors of the other three Gospels that Jesus mm -hmm. claimed to be the manna from heaven, the bread of life, and, and these things? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, um, we know that Matthew and the uh, St. Matthew and St. John were disciples. Um, I've wondered myself well, well, why only St. John... You okay. believe they were disciples. You don't know it. Okay. Don't just like you don't really know much either. So, no, you know, believe, John, believe is different okay. to knowing. Okay. So, St. John, uh, we believe uh, he, he was a disciple of Christ. And same with St. Matthew. St. Luke was a student of St. Paul. Uh, St. Mark, I think, uh, was taught by St. Peter. But, uh, so anyways... My theory is that St. John, uh, I clearly read his gospel account and see that he understands the philosophy of the Trinity. And so I believe that him hearing certain parables from Jesus, uh, because of his great understanding of the, the truth, he never forgot about those parables. Uh, now, these writings, or these quotes from Jesus, we still see the same meaning in the other gospel accounts. And especially in the writings of St. Paul in the Old Testament. Well, Paul, so, well, sorry, sorry, sorry. Paul, Paul wasn't yeah. an eyewitness to these great statements. Correct. I so said why that's why we, Paul as if he is? I said we see this. I didn't say that. You're going to paraphrase phrase me now? So I said oh, that oh, we sorry. see the okay, same Okay, we're talking meaning. about eyewitness. That's okay. Okay, listen to the position yeah. again. John is claiming no, I get that the Jesus position. spoke to the crowds and claimed to be the bread of life. Correct. Okay? Yet nobody before that gospel talks about this statement from Jesus, which is such a profound statement. So bringing Correct. Paul to the table has n nothing to do with what's being spoken about. Well, I assume in that objection, uh, I, I assume you're objecting to, to the gospel according to St. John because of the meaning of the words too, not just the words themselves. No, 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 no. But, look, if you look at the very okay. beginning of this particular stream, I said one of the things I've learned or uh, from this whole three months of what we've been doing, is in the Gospel of John, such profound statements are made by Jesus that this sure. is the all the go-to uh, verses of the Gospel of John where Christians claim divinity for Jesus come out of this Gospel. Now, we've ascertained through our um, investigation that the previous three Gospels were not written by eyewitnesses, including Matthew. And if you watch our stream on Matthew, you'll understand why we hold that position. And so they've got their information from eyewitnesses. Now, let's say, for example, we'll take the Gospel of Luke. And Luke said he spoke to eyewitnesses. So if Luke spoke to eyewitnesses, these eyewitnesses would have been there at the speech of Jesus when he claimed to be the bread of life. If they weren't there when he claimed to be a bread of life, then that means they weren't eyewitnesses and Luke wasn't getting his information on that event from eyewitnesses. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to figure out <clears throat> so first up, I said St. John, I assume, I'll have to look into this, and I'd like to hear what you were talking about. You were saying something about origin earlier. I'd like for you to repeat that, but I believe that St. John uh, held on to these parables in his heart because they, they stuck with him. He understood the philosophy and the deeper truth that uh, Jesus Christ God himself was teaching him. But, the, but, the, but the, here's uh, the thing you see. The Jews understood what Jesus meant when he said those words, didn't they? The Jews understood... Uh, the the Pharisees and people like that are the ones who yeah, actually believed he was the Messiah. The no, no. Well, the Pharisees didn't go mad when he said, "He's a bread of life." I I I can of myself do nothing. Uh, I can only do that which the Father does. No, no. The, when he the said, "He's a bread did. of life," no. Oh, the bread of life. Um, I think so. In that passage, is that in John six? 
They were there, right? So they didn't need to be um, know the parables of Jesus and be Trinitarian concept in their minds. They were Jews, and they knew when Jesus claimed to be the bread of life, he was claiming to be God. Okay. Um, um, I, I, Neil, you may might I, be right I, on that. I'll are you a Roman Catholic? And think about that. I know they got mad, and they kind of no, no, right, they got mad. So here's the thing: you, when see. you said you must prior to the flesh. Gospel of John, we have no evidence of Jews getting mad over this statement of Jesus. Sorry, what did over you say in that statement? Okay, this statement of Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, when Jesus said these words, the Jews got mad when he claimed to be the bread of life, yes? Sure. Right. Yes, now, now you're you saying, saying it should be in the other You course. were saying, because John was a Trinitarian concept in his heart, and he, he remembered these parables and such, and he understood what Jesus meant by these things, that's why he remembered them. But the point here is this, the Pharisees who were present when Jesus said these words, they understood exactly what he meant without having no Trinitarian concept nor having these parables in their heart. They knew exactly what he was saying. So if Jesus said these words historically, the Pharisees would have reacted in that way. And if the, and if Jesus, so if Jesus said these words, we should find prior to the Gospel of John, the Pharisees reacting to this statement of Jesus, which the people would have been speaking about. Just as Brother Imran gave a beautiful, beautiful analogy. If Jesus says to the people, a big hour-long speech, and he said, I'm going to give you a million dollars, Everybody will remember from that speech, there's a million dollars being given out here. And anyone who, if you spoke about this speech um, in another place by another person who was there, they would always remember the million dollars because that's the most profound part of that speech. But what we find with regards to this particular matter, let's just use the euphemism as a million dollars. Nobody prior to the Gospel of John, when they speak about this event, when Jesus made this speech, mentions the million dollars. So you've got two points here. Either everybody forgot that Jesus mentioned a million dollars or Jesus never mentioned a million dollars in the first place. And the author of the person who said he mentioned a million dollars made it up. I see. So I, I get what you're saying. It's just, one, I don't see the need for them or for, for us to see the other uh, gospel accounts to, to have these quotes for them to actually be true. Uh, second, it's possible that St. John had a particular interest in maybe Greek philosophy. And so this thing, the things really stuck out to him in a deeper way than the others. Like so you're missing the point. The Jews earlier, didn't need no Greek philosophy to get upset by it. The Pharisees were no, I, upset by yeah, it. That's fine. But why does why do we need to see it in the other gospel accounts when because first the other off, gospel John of, passed? Okay. Because the okay. other gospel you're accounts gonna, are go eyewitness right, testimony right. from eyewitnesses who okay. were there. And so if they were there and Jesus said these words and the Pharisees reacted the way they did, they'd be reporting that. But they're not. Well, I, I mean, I can't tell them what to do. I don't know what their intention no, was. No, no, no. But then the, the problem we is, see this, this is your problem now. Of Matthew so if, that nobody, we don't see if, if nobody prior to the Gospel of Crazy John stuff. is reporting this incident, nobody is reporting this incident, then you have to ask question whether this incident occurred or not. Well, no, it's a different point of view. They were in the same place, but it was a different point of view. No, so, it's a St. Matthew statement. writes certain things down that, that St. John doesn't write about, and they're insane things. No, like but I the thing that... is, you 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 see, you're talking now as if the authors of the Gospels were eyewitnesses themselves, writing their own testimony from what they saw. Matthew is that your position? John. Yeah, Saints Matthew and John. No, Luke. I'm talking Luke. Luke was not a an eyewitness. No, so he he spoke to the eyewitnesses. Luke learned from Saint Paul. Saint Paul learned from the others. But Paul wasn't there. So how can Luke look? Le... Who did Luke? I said Saint learn Paul learned from? from the. I don't know if you can hear me. But I, said, I, I can Luke hear you. Doesn't Luke Paul. say that he spoke to eyewitnesses? Didn't he do thorough investigation? I'm unsure, but I know that Saint Luke no, well, the, was the a student says of Saint that, Paul. It? Saint Paul being a, uh, taught by the others. So. Paul can't help Luke in this matter. The only people okay. who can help Luke in this matter are those who witness these matters. Well, sure, but those who witness these matters can tell Paul who tells Luke. Why can't these people he was tell a Luke? He student of Paul. But according to they Luke, could have. He I'm, says I'm he... unsure. But what is okay, this? but here's How the thing, Neo. Here's, a, here's the thing, Neo. According sure. to the author of the Gospel of Luke, he himself investigates. According to the... Oh, okay, okay. Well, there you go then. So and he, he speaks, speaks with eyewitnesses. Why? Right. Sure, sure, sure. Right, so, so if he spoke to eyewitnesses who were yeah. present where Jesus claimed to be the bread of life, why is he not reporting that what happened at that event? Well, I'm not sure, first off, which eyewitnesses he spoke with. There isn't an entire okay. group then then, then you've got the other problem now is then is whole okay. every time yeah but here's the problem you're you got objecting now, then. too quickly by the way i'm not able to finish my statements all right sorry yeah but here's the problem you uh, got now yeah continue. but straight away yeah. as soon as you say maybe those people people weren't eyewitnesses to that that event 
then who's Luke getting information from about that event? Well, if he says he's speaking with eyewitnesses, then I believe he's speaking with eyewitnesses. Which ones? I'm not sure. But St. John didn't need to speak with another eyewitness. No, 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 no. But the point is, he remembered the things. What we're saying, Neil, just please, 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 just stay with me. I get what you're saying. Continue. Said he spoke to eyewitnesses. If if these if Luke writes about this event that occurred in the Gospel of John about the bread of life, then those people must have been there. And if they were there, course, why are they not reporting? Right? Why are they not reporting this profound statement? Now, then you I'm said maybe sure. they weren't eyewitnesses to that. Yeah. Then well, that means they no. I didn't say that. I, I didn't you, say that. You did. You said maybe they You're weren't twisting eyewitnesses. Twisting my words. To that. Okay, no, sorry. I said I, I wasn't sure who Saint Luke spoke with. I said he spoke with Saint Paul, and you said, well, Saint Luke himself says no. that he he spoke with eyewitnesses. No, what I'm saying to you is this. You're saying. You, you said he spoke to Saint Paul initially. Then you got corrected. Correct. Because I showed you within the scripture, Luke well, says himself. Well, I know himself, he did learn from Saint Paul also. No, I understand what you're saying, but yeah. according to the scripture, according to the Gospel of Luke, Luke says he himself undertook it himself to investigate the eyewitnesses himself. Paul is not an eyewitness. Okay. I, I understand that. Right. I don't think you so get if, my if point. Luke is saying he's speaking to eyewitnesses, he's not speaking to Paul because Paul is not an eyewitness. Okay. Listen, I get that. I don't know what you're focused on this for. No, right. So I'll tell you why I'm focused on it, because you're trying to claim Paul, Luke got his information from Paul when Luke said he got his information from an eyewitness. I know he got so some because he was a student Paul. of St. Paul. No, but that rules out Paul giving information we don't about... Have to, sure, we don't have to talk about Paul. Right, well, you brought Paul, Paul to the table. I didn't. All right. Yes. So he's speaking you, to eyewitnesses You don't really now. get what I'm saying because you're too quick to speak, uh, Hamza. You're way too quick to speak. All right. Maybe you should I'll hear what I mean. Maybe you're slowly. interpreting me like you do the writings of, of the Gospels. No, Neil, I'm asking That's a simple question. I'm asking a simple question. You, I said to you, Luke spoke to the eyewitnesses. Luke writes about this event right. where Jesus claims to be the bread of life. Yet in Luke's account, there's no mention of bread of life. Right? Okay. So sure. I, the eyewitnesses didn't tell Luke the most profound thing Jesus said at that speech, or Jesus didn't say that thing at that speech. Right, sure, sure. Uh, I I would assume that they did not tell him, or maybe they could have told him and he didn't write it down. But maybe they just didn't tell him. But how does but that? It's one of the most profound things. Mean to come that out of therefore Saint John was lying. No, no, the, no, no. There were many profound point, things. If we don't find any mention in history of Jesus making such a profound statement until we get to the Gospel of John, and no other eyewitnesses mentions this report of Jesus making this statement, then that clearly means John has created this story, mate. Like it, it don't like it, it doesn't really matter. That. It doesn't clearly mean that, though. It's what does necessary. It mean, it, so here's it. On conclusion? one hand, so, so your conclusion can, can you is listen? this. Uh, I'm asking you a question. Your conclusion is that is necessary. Sorry, guys. I just want to interrupt, with guys. Idea. Guys, I'm just okay. going to. I'm just going to interrupt to let you know, uh, uh, I think it's Neo, yeah? Um, there's yes. a time delay between both you and Hamza, so you feel oh. that you're interrupting each other, but when there's a natural pause, Hamza's talking and vice versa, and it sounds like you're interrupting each other, you're not, it's just a natural oh. delay. So if you both could just, once you finish, just wait two seconds or so, and then you won't feel like you're being interrupted, okay? That's all that's okay. happening. Okay. There's no no oh. interruption there, okay? Oh, sorry about that. All right, guys. That. I, was, I was thinking he was interrupting me every time. Maybe we can say uh, your turn. And then uh, and then we hand it over to the next guy. All right. My turn. How about that? All right. Cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sure. Your turn. Okay. All right, 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 right. So here, here's the conclusion what we conclude from this point. Either everybody who was at present when Jesus made this profound statement didn't mention it to anybody. Or John made it up. That's your only choices. Now you want to believe so much that the gospel of John is true, you're willing to throw everything, every single eyewitness under the bus. That's what I've concluded from what you've said. But I could be wrong. Are right, you done? Your turn. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure how you get this idea that there are only two choices uh, for me to choose from. Uh, but there's also this idea which I believe that Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he taught the eyewitnesses. He taught everyone who was in his midst. Uh, the eyewitnesses just maybe didn't tell St. Luke. That's a theory. You know, it's not, I'm not saying this is the absolute truth, but it's a possibility. That's what we have okay. to recognize. No, that's fair enough. It is a possibility. 
You so said they're unreliable the eyewitnesses then? There are many more. Correct. Many more possibilities. Uh, that's just one of them. Okay. So would that mean the witnesses so could be unreliable then, isn't it? The witnesses could be unreliable? No. Yeah, the eyewitnesses. If they Not necessarily. No. Found things. No. no? Right. There's omitting and then there's committing. You know. Okay. Is it not a profound statement that, and the Jews got, the Pharisees got upset about it? Of course it was, yes. Right. And this is just one thing. There's so many things that apparently Jesus said that no one else thinks about. I see. Well, I mean, there are many things in the writings of St. Matthew and the writings of uh, St. Luke and, and Mark, uh, St. Paul's writings. But one thing we do know, there were no objectors. You know, these people all knew each other. And no one objected to this guy, and that guy didn't object to the other guy. And their students right. carried down their writings. So, so I think we had Can this conversation me? yesterday. Um, remind me when the student Polycarp quoted from the Gospel of John. Yeah, I don't believe he did quote from the Gospel of John. No, he didn't. So, so you just said his students. So his, his student even yes. quoted from him. St. Ignatius quoted it. No, but we're talking about Polycarp. Yeah, but St. Ignatius is a student of, of St. John. Saint Poly Saint Polycarp did quote from the letters of John. Maybe he no, didn't no, no, receive no, no. the gospel accounts. The gospel they didn't have printer machines the back of John. then. See, the question that needs to be asked: Did Polycarp believe that the Gospel of John was written by his uh, teacher? I I have to see if he ever mentions anything like that. But you can't um, conclude you know the, uh, conclude with the contrary. We do see one of John Saint John's students being Saint Ignatius of Antioch. He quotes his gospel. He actually quotes, uh, you know, where Christ is called the Logos or the Word. Uh, but we do have St. Polycarp's students' writings who does quote St. John. It's St. Irenaeus. And so yeah, but, it's but, possible but, that maybe at a certain point in time, uh, Polycarp, St. Polycarp received the letters of St. John, he, which he does quote word for word. Maybe later in his life, after that letter, he receives the gospel accounts and then passes them down to his disciple, St. Irenaeus. Uh, I think this is a Nazman Ijaz's time. Go on, Nazm. Uh, well, I was just going to ask you, Neo. Um, you know Polycarp, he does actually quote Do you have anything to say about that, though? Yeah, it's a pretty um, yeah, I was uh, just big going... possibility. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Please stop interrupting him, Nazm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just going to very quickly say um, Polycarp quotes from the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, whereas if he knew that, um, you know, his teacher wrote a gospel and knew about it, um, then you would expect that he would have quoted also from the fourth gospel as well, like in the same way he quotes the other gospels. And uh, yeah, Easy I'll to pass imagine. it on to Ijaz. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I do believe it's easy to imagine that Polycarp uh, would have quoted from John's Gospel if he knew that John had written a Gospel. And also, like in the final chapter of John's Gospel in 21, um, you have like a self-test, like you have a vindication that this Gospel was written or, or this report is from a disciple of Jesus. Whereas if John actually did write a Gospel during his lifetime, would have been self-evident it wouldn't need to be verified independently um since john very early on was a pillar of the church but you find that whenever the opportunity arises um the author seems to differentiate himself from the the beloved disciple and includes himself amongst the uh, the audience so like when he says we know his testimony is true this is the author speaking in which he includes himself amongst the audience and he differentiates himself from the beloved disciple. So uh, I have a Catholic Bible called the New American Bible, St. Joseph edition. And what they basically say is um, because the church was so convinced that Jesus was teaching through, through it, um, it was oft, it's become difficult to distinguish between what Jesus actually said and what the ch church taught because often they express their teachings in the words of Jesus. And so basically the fourth gospel expresses ideas of what 
people were saying about Jesus at the time when the fourth gospel was written, which would have been about 70 years after Jesus was taken up. Um, but I'll pass it on to Brother Ijaz. Well, I was wondering if Neil had a response to what you said. Uh, Neil, Neil just said uh, on oh, the... Yeah, can you hear me well? Here. Can, I, I can hear now. Can, can you hear oh. me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I was having problems yesterday, too. So I couldn't hear anybody oh, talking okay. there for, just for uh, a minute, I, but I, I did, heard the, yeah. the, maybe the last half of what you're saying. I'm sorry about that. Do you have Wi-Fi connection now, or are you using the nope, data from nope. your phone? It, I'm yep, just using the data. Now it's not the internet. It's for some reason I could hear certain people talking, but not others. Uh, okay. I heard that other people face this problem too with with the uh, stream stream duck or whatever it's called. I don't, I don't know what it's called, man. <laughs> but I see. Uh, so, um, yeah. do you remember the last thing that was said? I heard the last thing. Now you said. If I recall correctly, that Saint John differentiates himself from the disciples. Is that right? Or I'm sorry, the writer of that which we call the Gospel according to Saint John uh, differentiates himself from Saint John himself. That's right. Yes, and includes himself among the audience. Includes so, like in John, okay. chapter twenty-one, I believe it's verses uh, twenty-one or twenty-three and forward. Um, he basically says that this is the testimony of the beloved who have written down all these things and we know his testimony is true. So the we At the end of John twenty one. That's the last chapter that's, yeah. of the gospel. Okay. Are you so familiar could, with that verse? But yes, yes. So I think that was maybe uh maybe someone writing for him. I'm unsure. I'll have to look into that. So is is the writer who's writing for him is 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 he the one who wrote the fourth gospel? I I I'm not sure if it was someone writing for Saint John or Saint John himself. I'll have to check it out. Like I was saying, if it was someone writing for him, uh, I assume that Saint John was telling right to the man what to write down. So, so saying that his testimony is true. Okay. So, so how would we know how he got his information from St. John. How would we know that? I'd have to look at the early saints and, and other accounts of the early century and uh, see what they say. Um, do, do the saints tell us which John um, that the, um, they're speaking about? Because it seems that um, John was a popular, like the, the name John was a popular name amongst Christians and we seem to have at least three famous Johns, John of Patmos, John the Elder, and John the son of Zebedee. And it <laughs> seems that different church writers um, identify the fourth gospel with these three different Johns. Okay, do they say that there are three different Johns? This is something I'll have to look into, but I have heard it. So, some uh, say it's John the Elder. He wrote it, and some say it was John of Patmos, and some say it was John the son of Zebedee. So John it son doesn't. Son Zebedee. Okay. Yeah. So would, it, would it, these things have an effect on you, Neil, if they were true? No, I'm unsure. So you're going to go investigate like, all these things. You're going to yeah, go check I, out. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to look into. I'm. I'm curious though, if any early saint or or church father. Um, you can even put in there maybe Origin or whoever else you'd like to check out. I'm wondering if any of them say that there were three different Johns. Or is it just that one calls him this and one calls him that? Uh, they uh, differentiate uh, between John the Presbyter and John the son of Zebedee. They consider them to be two different people. That's what Eusebius comments on when he, uh, he references, uh, I think in Church History Book 3, Chapter 39, when he speaks about what he? Papias uh, conveyed that uh, Papias himself could have been confused. Uh, so it, it, it might uh, be worth it to follow up on what the uh, church fathers did write about these individuals. But it's clear that they didn't consider them to be the same person. Okay, Except for to, John of Patmos. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, so, um, so now, continue. is it only Eusebius? Is it only Eusebius that says that these people were, um, he says it very explicitly, unambiguously? Depending on who you read. Richard Bochum, for example, when he analyzes what um, what Papias is said to have indicated in the first place, 
basically says that the errors in which, uh, sorry, the, the words that Papias uses distinguishes between the errors of these two individuals, that they don't belong to the same one, and thus he concludes from that, that they are likely speaking about two different people. But uh, uh, we can look more closely at some primary data um, if that needs Okay. Oh, sorry, Hamza, so, you're muted. Hamza, you're muted. You're welcome to come on next week, Neil. Yeah, do some research, oh, go check you. it out. Yeah. And then... Um, sure. yeah, yeah. Because we're waiting for a Christian to refute anything we've said, man. And it's getting uh, uh, laborious. Uh, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, by the way, Neil, I, I just remembered, um, you know, this beloved disciple is actually not part of the, the 12th. Um, he's like some extra disciple that's not mentioned by no one else. Like none of the other gospels mention him, neither does Paul or any other New Testament. Um, it's only the fourth gospel that mentions his beloved disciple, and nor does the nor does this fourth gospel refer to him as John. Um, it, the idea that his right. name is John comes from church tradition, and it yeah. seems that church tradition doesn't also agree as to which John it is. Um, so it, it does seem like it's an anonymous book written by an anonymous author. And also, like, since you're willing to be open to the idea that um, this secretary may have instead written the, you know, the, the fourth gospel, um, we, we don't know still who this secretary was, like who this writer is. Uh, we don't have a name or a, a personality. Um, so I, I, I still feel that the fourth gospel is written by an anonymous author. And I think out of the four, it's probably the most explicit one that, um, you know, that um, it doesn't uh, like inexplicitly say that he's an anonymous author because he differentiates himself between this eyewitness um, and himself, which he includes amongst the, the audience. Okay, so first off, the idea. Thank you. First off, the idea that Saint John, or the one I should say, the one spoken of in that which we call the Gospel according to Saint John, the idea that he was a thirteenth, if you will. Uh, where did you get that idea from? That he's not one of the yeah, twelve. So um, you can read about it more um, in Raymond Brown's um, the Fourth Gospel and the Community of the Fourth Gospel, or I forgot the exact title. Uh, but uh, um, Raymond Brown is one of these. Um, but you, you can compare like the fourth gospel with the other gospels and see um, that the, the beloved disciple is not one of the 12, but is some special disciple which only John seems to know about. And this is another example where you would expect that this disciple who's so beloved and important, um, if he did exist, then you would expect him to be mentioned in the other gospels. And some, I think, in order to get away, like try to reconcile this problem, um, is to say that maybe the other gospel writers didn't mention him because the disciples were jealous of this beloved disciple and hence why Mark didn't write about him or choose to mention him because, jo because John's gospel, the fourth gospel, shows Peter um, possibly to be jealous of this beloved disciple because Jesus seems to um, a bit be harsh towards Peter when he says, like, what is it to you if this disciple lives on or, you know, dies before I come? I see. Okay. Uh, so now when I was asking, where'd you get this idea? I mean, in the substance, let's go to the actual source instead of reading some other guy's book where he can just take the evidence, come up with some theory based sure. on that you could come up with infinitely many theories based on a single piece of evidence you know what i mean yeah and so, so what this in the substance you know? is very important in john's gospel he's the one who jesus allows to you know um lean on his breast um and he jesus speaks of him very highly so such an important figure uh you would expect him to be mentioned by the other gospel writers and also in the book of acts um as well as um in the epistles of paul because paul speaks about you know the, the pillars of the church uh but he doesn't explicitly refer to this beloved disciple okay. so now it, beloved in what manner because i know that saint mary was given uh to be taken care of by saint john who we believe is the beloved the disciple spoken of in the gospel according to saint john and yeah so it could be he's beloved in that manner could be maybe in a, in a different way 
Um, so well, we'd have to interpret to beloved it. correctly. Yeah. I need to look into that. I will. Say I mean, that. it's church tradition that interprets the beloved as being John, but John doesn't that. explicitly. Okay, Neil, you got a lot to reflect upon. Um, yeah, hopefully right. see you next week. yeah, yeah. I'll go and I'll gather some evidence. What time next week are you going to be doing this? Uh, we're going to do the stream nine o'clock uh, next week, inshallah. Oh, is that one hour earlier before? Or the uh, uh, sorry, like what, one hour <laughs> earlier than the normal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine o'clock is one hour before ten o'clock. So th that that would be uh, four four p.m. Eastern, Eastern Standard, Standard Time. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay 14, with oh, you, uh, okay. Ijaz? Four yeah, yeah. p.m. Yeah. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah. All right. That'll work. Okay. Well, good talking to you guys, and uh, we can take yeah, care. Yeah, come again. I enjoy meet it. again. Cool. Yeah, take I, care, I, man. I really hope. Good night. You too. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Right. One Colosseum. You've got 10 minutes. I it a, a wrap. Yeah, hi. I don't want much time anyway. I just want to address uh, Luke 9 and John 6, which you just spoke about. Now, the miracle uh, happens in Bethsaida. And they are a bunch of people uh, taking uh, some boats uh, across the uh, Dead Sea to Capernaum to follow Jesus. Now, a uh, uh, presence of the miracle vary from 4,000 to 5,000. Now, regardless of the number, you somehow assume that they have already a fleet waiting for them to cross the sea so they all be present and hear Jesus' uh, statements. Now, based on what are you making these uh, assumptions? Okay. Did the Pharisees hear him? No. It says the Jews, not Pharisees. Oh, did the Jews hear him? Some. It doesn't say all. It wasn't which all Jews? Israel in one place. Oh. Okay, so which Jews heard him? The ones that are present, of course. The eyewitnesses? Yeah, the eyewitnesses. Some okay. were there, so some catch up with them. All right, so it's not an assumption. they hear the statement. Oh, okay, but it's not an assumption. They were eyewitnesses. No, the eyewitnesses are not the assumption. The assumption you make is when Jesus makes a statement, it's like why uh, not Ill, all Israel hears it. So if Luke comes well, I didn't in... Make that assumption. didn't make that assumption. Yes, because, because when Luke's come and interview um, a witness, you assume to say the same thing. Okay. Okay. Like Jesus spoke in Jerusalem, like Jesus oh, oh, spoke in oh, Capernaum, okay. in different places of the country, which okay. I think... Just my okay. point. All right. So in the Gospel of Luke, when he speaks about this event, yeah, did Luke get this information from eyewitnesses? Probably. He doesn't say. Well, do you, well, it does. Luke says he spoke to eyewitnesses. Okay. So would those eyewitnesses have heard what Jesus said? No. In, in Luke, it's only the miracle no, no, no. itself. Would, would the eyewitnesses have heard what Jesus said? No, because the bread of life, it's in Capernaum. It's across the sea. So, the, oh, so they weren't eyewitnesses then to what Jesus said? No. So then, where, Luke where? Oh, okay. then Luke didn't get his information from eyewitnesses then, did he? So, the miracle happens in Bethsaida, right? No, so did Luke, Jesus say what I said to you? Yes, but Luke... Right, so you, you've just any said... Of the 5, no, Luke could pick any witness of 5,000 for the event. Okay, okay. So if there was in a person John, who told... Okay, okay. This is, listen, and address what I'm saying, please. Did Luke get his information from somebody who heard what Jesus said? <clears throat> Must have been someone, yes. And they heard what Jesus said? Yes, but only the account in Bethsaida, not in Capernaum. Make no, they didn't hear what Jesus said. Different. No, he said a few things. In, Cap in Bethsaida, where the miracle took place, like bring the fish, do this, do this. Right, right, right. But where did that happen? In Bethsaida. Right, and how did Luke know what happened there? No, where did he say this statement? The statements, I'm the bread of life, it's made in Capernaum across the Dead right, Sea. Right, right, right. And, and you're saying that uh, Luke didn't write about that? No, Luke wrote about the miracle and he could pick up any witness for the miracle. It doesn't have to be necessarily one of the people that follow Jesus all the way to Capernaum to hear the well, statement that John adds to so, the event. Right, so you're saying the eyewitnesses that Luke spoke to no. were who? Look, me and my wife, we eating here. I'm going somewhere else and I speak something. Someone asked my wife if we had dinner in house. Yes, she can say we had dinner in house, but she cannot say what I'm doing after I'm leaving. You get the point. 
What's not all sorry, 4,000. Not all. Find out. What, sorry, uh, not what, what are we on about? Not all well, 4,000. How did you get to that of... analogy? Why are these bizarre analogies coming out today? Because, I don't get it. Because you infer that all 5,000 people that witnessed the miracle also passed the sea to Capernaum to hear everything. So, <laughs> did, did, did the Jews, listen, did the Jews go to Capernaum? Some. Some. Okay. Some. Right. So where did they report this Jesus saying these things then in history? It's, it's John reporting. No, 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 no. The Jews got upset, yes? Yeah. No, let me make it easier. There are 5,000 witnessed the miracle. Let's say only 2,500 follows Jesus to Capernaum. And Luke gets his story from the one that, from the 2,500 2, that didn't go. So they didn't hear the second part of the okay. statement that John said. Can I just address that? Is that all right? from somebody who did go and Jesus didn't say yes. that thing. You assume, see? So and assuming. I want to know. No, I'm not. It only says that they followed. It doesn't say all of them but followed. You're assuming and Luke got his information from somebody who didn't follow Jesus. Yes, he can be. That's your assumption. Yes, but it's a reasonable so assumption. You're you're assuming assuming. When you're, no, but you're saying I'm assuming when you're assuming. I'm not assuming. Why? Because if he would have uh, find a witness, he would have had this statement too. Unless Jesus so didn't say it. Unless Jesus didn't say it. Ah, be serious. Well, that's what it means, doesn't it? No. Go on, Doctor. No, explain to him, please. Nicely. I just wanted to just... Um, I can't believe this. Right place. in the beginning of Luke, because I, I know that we're restricting this to Luke, but actually Matthew and Mark don't mention the I am statements either. Um, which is also also you know something you have to account for. But Luke says right in the beginning of his gospel, and, and Brother Ajas has mentioned this really importantly in, when we were talking about Luke, uh, in verse 3, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Yes. Now, Luke is talking about writing account and in order. Got it. Yes. So if he is investigating... Not in order, but... Accuracy, accuracy, not necessarily chronological. You want to say the Luke the account? Okay. No, okay. Didn't, didn't, didn't Luke say that way. Mark is disorderly and he's going to do his orderly, sure. which is chronology? Go on. So if, well, if you're cool. following Jesus through the narrative and your, and your investigation and you know that Jesus went from point A after doing a miracle to point B, you would, in your in in any in any investigation that you would do and i think and let me use the word carefully investigated everything from the beginning so in any carefully invest careful investigation that you do that's going to be orderly or accurate would you not find somebody who has gone to the place after this event had happened to speak to them about what had happened to that place at that place i would say yes and the evidence i would use for this is that would make an that would make a, an orderly and accurate account. The the second thing is that the other people who wrote about the same event, Matthew and Mark, also don't mention the the bread of life statement. So what what it seems to be is to make the narrative fit. You you bring the only possible way of trying to do this that no one else saw this apart from when John wrote about it. But actually, Mark and Matthew write about it. Yeah, it's found actually in, in all four gospels. This but is no not the issue. John, nobody mentions the most important million dollar question, which is, I'm going to give you a million dollars. I am the bread of life. Yes, but if you would say, I don't know where you live, but if you say, I'm going to give you a million dollars, uh, how many people think you'll hear you? How many people of the ones that don't hear you will come, actually? Imran, can I just say something? Sorry, because I've allowed him to get away with something which is not true. Sure. Because I'm reading the, the verses in John, yeah? And the crowd who had, had the miracle all got in boats. It doesn't say some of them. It says the crowd. So why, why are you now splitting the crowd? It says, once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get... Where, where have you got this idea that yes. half of them went and half didn't? Exactly my point, like I told you. You think they had the fleet already prepared for 5,000 people to cross the sea. It's exactly my point. So all of them would hear uh, the, crowd. the event. The crowd. Yeah, so you think 
um, they cross like 100 now, 100, and, and they all wait for the 5,000. What number are you, 48? Oh, okay, we'll wait for two more boats, and then we're going to go and hear Jesus saying the statement. Why you see what I mean? It's funny, though, because that in, you're making a mockery out of the word of God. I'm just going to put that out there. No. Like the, the way that you're presenting this as if it's a joke to you, Bob, we've got to be respectful about the scripture of our Christian brothers yes, and sisters, but, right, Stefan? But you have to consider the times. So if you want like 5,000 people to cross the, the, uh, the Dead Sea, you would have to have a fleet ready for them to jump on and just uh, yeah. move across. But wouldn't they be fisher people? Why would they need a fleet if they're fisher people in Galilee? We're speaking, we're speaking on a Dead Sea, relatively small sea, and we'd need boats for 5,000 people to cross at once. Well, I would assume that they already had boats on the Dead Sea. 5,000. It doesn't Five. have to be 5,000. It would be a large amount of Exactly my point. So they couldn't cross all at once to hear that particular statement. They just need 500 been... boats. Let, but let, let's assume, let's assume say? Stefan, Stefan, let's assume that there were 400, right? 400 people went across. Absolutely zero of them said it to Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Like, how does that happen? This is what I'm saying. Mark and Luke could have gotten from someone who didn't make it on time to give a particular statement. Yeah, That's but, the old... yeah, but Stefan, hold on, Stefan. Then this implies that they didn't have access to anyone with the second half of the story. That that's a bit like I go to a football match, right? And I watch the. Uh, I don't know if you follow football, but no? uh, like I I watch uh, like United play. You know, me, Allah, forgive me. No, that's but, assumption as well. That's assumption again. He could have had like ten witnesses to make sure the account mm -hmm. happened, and, and five you, of them. Making assumptions. Stephen, don't you Stephen, get it? Hold on, Stefan. Just hear my argument, right? So the first forty-five minutes happen, and you know I see all my friends here. I decide it's a United match. I better get home before the second half begins because it's going to be useless anyhow. I go home and, you know, I don't know what happens in the second half. So then I go and I start asking the uh, the witnesses, who was there at the second half? Okay. All of you were, oh, I found a group of people that were. I asked this group of people, what did Jesus say at that place? Uh, we don't know. We saved it for the guy who's writing the Gospel of John. That yeah. realistically doesn't yeah, happen. But Realistically, the analogy doesn't work because you are leaving a full stadium. If you take half of stadium home with you and then you'd go ask secondhand the witnesses, uh, that would be a different story. But, but I would point. ask them and they would tell me I wasn't there for the entire thing. I think my yes. friend uh, Jim was there. They go to Jim. Yes. I wasn't there. So they do all of this and they couldn't find a single person that was there for the second yes. half. But let's say he asked 20, 20 people. Let's say he asked 20 people out of... Um, 5,000 or 4,000. Yeah. Okay, 20 people, let's say, just to make sure he got the story right. And five of them hears uh, this statement, but because it's only five out of 20, he decides to leave it because it hold might on. not be true. So, hold sorry, on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm just saying. It's, uh, it's Luke, Listen, if he's doing thorough investigation, he would say, um, do you know anybody who was there? And you would go and ask them, wouldn't you? How long this it will take you to 5,000 5, people in that time to go to each address and ask them all the the one. Come on. Jesus is Could calling himself I God. Who was question. there when Jesus called himself the bread of life? I was. Caper all right. Capernaum was a relatively small small city. The, the Jews, rest of them. The Jews oh. were grumbling. The Jews were upset. They'd be talking. The ones they hear. I can't believe the hoops you guys jump no. through. Can I ask a question? <laughs> is, uh, did Jesus, did uh, Luke believe that Jesus... Was the Messiah? I don't know what Luke believed. I know what I believe. I can't say what you believe. I don't know. No, Luke. 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 <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he believed. You don't he know what wrote, he and I assume he believed, but I, I'm not God. I don't know what other people believe. So you're not really interested in having a discussion then, Luke? Uh, no, I know what you, you, you're going to. Because, because the thing is, you want me to make, you, again, no, no, assumptions. Okay, I won't ask you a question, I'll say it. If Luke believed that he was researching the life of an important person like Jesus, who he thought was the Messiah on earth, I don't believe he'd give up finding someone who, was, who accompanied him through his life to write an account for him. What you're saying to him, me, is that he, trued, he tried to speak to two or three people and then gave up. Now, if, you're, if 
if you know anyone with religious conviction who believes that they are trying to find out about who they believe would be God on earth if you believe that he believed that, you don't know because you don't know what he believes because you're not God. If you if you believe that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah and he's trying to find out about him, why would he why would he not have the conviction to find the person who accompanied Jesus across the the, the Dead Sea? You're saying he gave up. One second, this is what Papias this is why Papias stayed in Hierapolis because it was the perfect midway between Rome and Jerusalem. So you can stop everyone and ask. You're basically saying that Mark, who met the disciples, had less faith than Papias, who only met a few of them allegedly in his later years. How does that work out? I mean, if Mark was described work. by Peter, wasn't Peter there? Yeah, but Mark can say what Peter, what Peter say based on his testimony. Now, no, according Peter, to the gospel... Peter would have been there to hear the statement. <clears throat> Imagining, hold on. You're imagining, you're imagining that uh, Mark's going around. Is was anyone there? And then you know, Peter is off in the background mm -hmm. saying, no, oh, "You imagine, was. you imagine Jesus having like a speaker, loudspeaker for everyone oh. to hear." I, I can't, I can't listen to this anymore. Sorry, mate. Oh, mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah, it's okay. Buddy. Give yes. Daniel, let Daniel have a last say. Daniel, you're the boss, <laughs> mate. You're the boss. Hold on, hold on. Bef bef can, can the admin do me a favor? Can the admin do me a favor? Yeah. I need the admin to put only Daniel's face on the screen, right? Now. Okay. Only Daniel's face, right? Where the hell did I put this image? Where the hell did I put this image? All right, Daniel. Got, no, no. You gotta say only you're the Daniel. Boss, do it. Daniel, you gotta, you gotta move the hand from the face, Daniel. Okay, I just want to see your inspection. Are you unmuted, Daniel? Yeah, he's unmuted. Daniel, can you give me a verbal? Yes, I am unmuted. Uh, can, uh, you me, can you hear me, Daniel? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, look at the camera. Oh, look at the like camera. That. And they see us. Because of the sexist system, two unemployed women will try to survive by entering the organized business of gold diggers. Where is this from, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Daniel, guys. Where is this from? Daniel, where did I get Because <laughs> when I look at you, Daniel, you don't look like the man. That's, that's you move. don't look like the kind of man that would write an okay, entire okay. movie. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. Come on, Shala. Okay. Daniel, what were you thinking? We're playing, we're playing like what? that. What were you thinking when you wrote? Daniel, I'm available to be in your movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we will start casting. I, uh, I don't have an agent, I, but... <laughs> uh, it's okay, we, we, here in Dominican Republic, we don't do... Oh, don't thank do, you. Uh, like, working with agents. Oh, after COVID, after COVID, I'll, I'll come. <laughs> uh, well, just, so, just so you know, Daniel... I uh, can't do anything to you. Daniel, just to be clear, Nazem was volunteering to be one of the two women. I don't know how that would work, ever. <laughs> yeah. Hamza, you're muted, bro. Hamza, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Wrap it up now. I'm tired. I'm tired. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Daniel, last words for today's show, not for anything else. What? what? Last words. Last words. Oh, okay. I I, I want to go uh, once again with that uh, with that thing that uh, why why other guys didn't didn't quote this or didn't wrote they wrote that those words down. Sorry, I, I I'm, I'm I'm trying to do something before just for you. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I'm worried now. <laughs> I don't know if you know that I'm a graphic designer. So Okay, this is gonna end badly. That's basically what he's saying. Ijaz, he you've called me out, I'm gonna call you out. Yeah. Uh, um, and I wanna say I take offense to Nazam's question that how could he with a beard portray a woman in a movie? Have you not seen have you not seen Nazam? Uh uh what's that Monty Python movie with uh Life of uh, Brian. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's um, come on, you gotta know the facts here. Life of Brian. <laughs> But final words, Dan, because we're going to go soon, Dan. We're going to wrap up. Uh, Hamza uh, is busy. I have, to, I have to wait. Okay, can, can you, can, can I share my screen? Uh, just, just, just to show you, this is a premiere. This is a, a, a exclusive. I, I object to this because I think I know where this is heading. I object bang, bang. to it. Come on, man. Bang, please. Please. Can you share it then? It's up to Dan. Uh, it, yeah, if you share the screen, I can. I. I can. Um, I'm the okay. one that manages it. So if it's dodgy, I can see it before it goes on. <laughs> okay. So yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, share the screen. Okay. Okay. Are we ben, ready? Don't let me burn, Ben. Don't let me burn right. here. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make. <laughs> 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 Just for you. Print screen. Okay. Print screen. <laughs> okay, print screen. Okay, I will. Uh, oh my goodness. This is a brilliant ending, mashallah. Mashallah. Daniel, you should be on here every week. We love you. Come on now. I've never looked that good. That's the first suit I've ever worn in my entire life, and I look amazing. Mashallah. <laughs> uh, That's a wrap. Daniel, always hey, a pleasure. We look answer, forward to seeing you next answer. week. Please, no, 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 please. Let me ask you something. <laughs> when I can test all the all the Islam thing according to the Tanakh. That's not the criteria to test the Quran with. What? That's not the criteria to test the Quran with. The Quran is the criteria. No, no, no. No, this is the thing. I believe this is true. Yeah, I, I don't. Okay, so when we can test this thing? Yeah, so he's so saying we'll we'll do, we test the Old Testament. It's the other way around. You can test the Tanakh against the Quran. Okay. So what is I was asking you to do this like this. Serious? Daniel, Daniel, just listen to these words very carefully. When we do revelations, you're going to become a Muslim. Inshallah. Inshallah. Because your whole belief system right now is based on revelations. No. It is. No, it's according to the Torah. No, it's according to revelations. I believe revelations. Yes, what I'm saying to you. So when we take revelations off you, then inshallah you'll become a muslim <laughs> after after sorry should i say that after we demonstrate the quran is the word of allah without error then you'll have no choice Be then you'll just surrender mate Be, no no you I, I, surrender to god surrender to I, god I, mean. I, I, can beat, I can beat you with this believe what you want to mate daniel we'll have you that's, on daniel that's what next Christians week <laughs> Okay, he's been right. the gun. It's a gun show. What's going on here, guys? <laughs> yeah, but the problem is he brought a knife to a gunfight. That's a problem. Oh, but well, you're right. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Daniel, see you next week, mate. Good See Thanks. you later, mate. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Oh, that was a wrap. Okay, so uh, oh. nine.